I'm honored to have as our guests um, um, Professor David Stern of the University of Iowa, uh, Professor James Conant, University of Chicago and uh, Universität Leipzig, the author Christian Erbacher, uh, Universität Siegen in Germany, Ray Monk, Emeritus from the University of Southampton and uh, author of the famous Wittgenstein biography, The Duty of Genius, and now Professor Alan Janik from Innsbruck. Uh, about the Wittgenstein Initiative, for those of, uh, of you who don't know us, um, the Wittgenstein Initiative is uh, a Vienna-based uh, international forum that aspires to make present in the city of his birth, Ludwig Wittgenstein, one of the greatest thinkers and most remarkable individuals of the 20th century. We aim to demonstrate Wittgenstein's present day relevance in various areas of public and private life and bring his cultural legacy to the general uh, public. Uh, short introductions of our guests, uh, David G. Stern is a professor of philosophy and a collegiate fellow in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences at the University of Iowa. His research uh, interests include history of analytic philosophy, philosophy of language, philosophy of mind, and philosophy of science. Uh, he's author and editor of numerous relevant publications on Wittgenstein uh, at the Cambridge University Press and also Oxford University Press. And most important tonight, Professor Stern is editor of the current uh, Cambridge Elements se uh, series, The Philosophy of Ludwig Wittgenstein, of which the book we discuss tonight is a part. Uh, Professor James Conant, uh, has written extensively on topics in philosophy of language, ethics, uh, and uh, metaphilosophy. Uh, he's especially well known for his writings on Wittgenstein and his association with the new Wittgenstein School of uh, Wittgenstein Interpretation, uh, initiated by Cora Diamond. He's currently a uh, Chester D. Tripp Professor of Humanities, Professor of Philosophy, and Professor in the College at the University of Chicago. He's Humboldt Professor of Philosophy and Co-Director of the Center for Analytic German Idealism at the University of Leipzig. He's also, uh, also Director of the Center for German Philosophy at the University of Chicago. Under his leadership, these two research centers form the main axis of an international philosophical network spanning Germany, Israel, and the United States. Professor Alan Janik is an Austrian and US American professor of philosophy and cultural history at the universities of Vienna and Innsbruck. Through his work with uh, Stephen Tolmin, Wittgenstein's Vienna, published in 1973, he became one of the well-known philosophers and historians in the field of intellectual life of Vienna around 1900. Professor Janik has led several important Wittgenstein projects at the Brenner Archive in Innsbruck, not least the electronic edition of Wittgenstein's correspondence, about which uh, we will certainly speak tonight. Uh, <clears throat> Yannick was also Professor of Philosophy, Skill and Technology Program at the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. He has taught also at Stockholm University, uh, University of Graz and the University of Bergen in Norway. Ray Monk is a British philosopher and writer. He's uh, Emeritus Professor at the University of Southampton where uh, he taught uh, from 1992 until uh, 2018. He's author of Ludwig Wittgenstein, The Duty of Genius, as well as a, of a two-volume biography of Bertrand Russell and of the Robert Oppenheimer biography Inside the Center. And the author of tonight's book, Christian Erbacher, works in the Collaborative Research Center Media of Cooperation at the University of Siegen. He has done extensive research on the history of Wittgenstein's paper after his death, especially uh, at the Wittgenstein, uh, Wittgenstein archives at the University of Bergen and uh, at the von Fricht Wittgenstein archives at the University of Helsinki. 
Uh, he already has published detailed portraits of Wittgenstein's literary trustees. Uh, very interesting from our here in Vienna point of view is uh, his account on the first attempt of a Wittgenstein biography undertaken by Friedrich August von Hayek in 1953. Uh, for the current time, uh, for this and next year, uh, Mr. Erbacher is um, working uh, in, as a cognitive behavioral uh, therapist before returning to Wittgenstein studies very soon. Uh, now, if I may ask Christian first to uh, make a statement about his book, um, a first short statement, but perhaps first uh, shortly explain what is uh, cognitive behavior behavioral therapy, because it sounded very interesting to me when I heard it for the first time. Thank you. Now you hear me, right. Yeah. Um, yes, thank you very much, Radmila. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy is my translation to uh, the German term cognitive Verhaltenstherapy. This is the main uh, method or area uh, of psychotherapy in Germany. So, uh, it's not psychoanalysis that is mostly done here in, in, in Germany, in German hospitals uh, with patients, but cognitive behavioral therapy. And well, yes, I undergo uh, the, the training to become a, a psychotherapist. And um, for me, it's very interesting to see uh, uh, what I think during uh, this training uh, with the background in uh, um, Wittgenstein studies I have. So, um, so maybe uh, one day uh, I can uh, I can also uh, think about this psychotherapy from the point of view of someone who has uh, done the studies that I have done. Yes. So it may maybe it comes together in in the future. Yeah. Right now I'm working in hospital, so I'm doing this training. Yes. Oh. And so, about the book? Yes, now the book. Um, I, I, I've sent you some uh, uh, pictures, maybe uh, while I uh, say a few words on the, how I wrote this book or how I came to write this book, uh, you can show the pictures. Yeah. Um, that may be interesting. So uh, the, whole, the whole story of the book began 10 years ago. Uh, it was in Helsinki when the von Richt archives opened. And you, you see the, the presentation I sent you, you have the, the picture of... This is uh, in Helsinki? Can, can, you, can you show it to the screen? Yeah. Right. Um, well, this is this is where it all started. It's it's this uh, picture is made from the uh, von Richt archives from the room uh, mm -hmm. where where I uh, first came across the sources that are um, on the basis that form the basis of the uh, current publication. Um, in the in the next picture, uh, this is. Uh, taken from inside the von Richt archives and maybe you can show it, yes. So, um, 10 years ago, the von Richt archives opened for the first time and uh, what was stored there were the materials that uh, Georg Kennig von Richt worked with in connection with editing Wittgenstein's papers. Um, and, and he was one of the literary heirs that Wittgenstein had appointed. Now, uh, there are lots of working materials in these archives, uh, but also uh, the correspondence between von Richt and the two other literary executors that Wittgenstein had appointed. And these two are uh, Rush Rees and Elizabeth Anscombe. The, the, the main part, 
of the correspondence between these three literary heirs uh, are stored at the National Library in Finland. And these are about 1,000 letters that uh, have been exchanged between the three um, in the time. Uh, yes? I'm sorry. So, so Terribly sorry. Um, yes, please, please continue. What I see on YouTube now is that it is uh, working normally. Good. Yeah. So, um, well, the, it, the whole idea of writing the book uh, that we are going to talk about um, uh, comes from reading the correspondence between the three literary executors, Rush Ries, Elizabeth Enskamp, and Georg Henrik von Richt. And the main part of this correspondence is uh, stored at the National Library of Finland in Helsinki. Yeah. These are about 1,000 letters uh, from 1951 to uh, 2000, um, 2000, yes. Now, uh, when I came there 10 years ago, my main interest was uh, to find out some secrets, uh, how the literary executors may have manipulated uh, the manuscripts in order to make uh, the books. Um, but what I found was uh, a fascinating story uh, between these three literary heirs. Uh, what you show now is uh, one of the first letters that Elizabeth Enskamp uh, sent to von Richt. Um, this is just to to get an impression how these letters look like. Um, now we, we have, yes? Uh, this letter is uh, from January 51, uh, even before Wittgenstein's death. Right. They, uh, Enskamp and von Richt had met already in, in Wittgenstein's uh, classes. So they began to correspond uh, before Wittgenstein died. Um, and then Anscombe, uh, after Wittgenstein says, Anscombe informed that von Richt should become one of his literary heirs and von Richt was very surprised by this news. Uh, but he had, Wittgenstein had told Anscombe and he had told Ries. Um, so uh, this correspondence uh, is a, a fascinating uh, trialogue, if you want so, uh, spanning over 50 years um, of three, philosophers who uh, exchange reasons and thoughts about how to deal with Wittgenstein's papers, how to make them uh, available in the best possible way. And this is a fascinating uh, discussion that one can read in this uh, correspondence. In German, we have the term Briefroman. I don't know if there's an English term like this, an epistolary, epistolary novel or something like this. And this is really, uh, the, these letters are something like this. Um, there's so much uh, of human voice in the letters, so much of uh, uh, conflicts in between the lines, so much uh, yeah, of friendship in between the lines, uh, so much of uh, devotion uh, to, to Wittgenstein and, and the tasks they got and Yes, uh, the voices of these three very different philosophical characters. They are bound together by Wittgenstein's will. Uh, and this made the, the whole um, Briefroman uh, starting and, and keeps it going. Right. Um, sorry, sorry. Hello. <laughs> no, no, um, yeah. Uh, she will join us much later, yeah. Now, um, Having had the experience of reading these thousand letters, um, I thought it would be fascinating uh, to somehow do research on this story. And then I uh, had the fortune to get support from um, universities and institutions and uh, persons, individuals who supported my idea to to uh, explore this story in more detail. And so I traveled to um, 
libraries, not in, in Helsinki, but also in, in Swansea, where the RIS archives are stored, to the Rand Library in Cambridge, and um, could follow the sources uh, that are hinted at in the correspondence. And I had the, uh, the, the fortune to um, make uh, quite a number of interviews with those who uh, knew uh, the literary executors and I could ask them about how they worked, um, uh, how to understand their letters because there are lots of voices in it but you, uh, it needs a lot of uh, a background knowledge to uh, understand what's going on there. And so the interviews with persons uh, among them, some of them are here with us in the discussion, like with James Cohn, and I could uh, uh, talk uh, very uh, for long for long uh, hours in in Kirchberg, and and Yannick helped me a lot to understand this. Um, but also some who are not with us today, uh, like Brian McGinney, uh, he was uh, very kind to let me. Uh, stay in his house for three days and um, look at his papers. Um, there's also, I showed you, uh, I sent you one letter uh, yes. that comes from a McGuinness uh, archive. Uh, that's a an, that's an letter by Antcom. Uh, McGuinness uh, and the new translation that um, McGuinness made in the uh, of the tractatus in, in the yeah. 50s. Um, now McGuinness has, has asked Anscombe about the translation and here's the answer that he got. Uh, and sources like this uh, uh, were made um, available by uh, single persons who have private archives. So this is also a very important uh, area of sources. Uh, not only what is kept at institutions, but also uh, with living persons and uh, of course, together with uh, the memories of these living persons. A very, very important uh, background uh, uh, research. Now, I, I, and, and it was fun to, under, uh, to do this work, reading, uh, uh, hunting, so, so to speak, these uh, uh, interesting documents. And uh, I, brought with me, or I, I sent to you some of the highlights uh, that, that I uh, found. Um, you, you got the folders, Radmila? Yes, yes. Uh, so in, the, in the Von Richt folder, uh, in the Von Richt archive, there was the uh, draft for biography by Friedrich August von Hayek, written in 1953. And together with the uh, letters around this project by uh, von Hayek, uh, there was a very interesting um, episode uh, that uh, in this whole story of editing uh, Wittgenstein. Uh, you you didn't send me uh, autographs, uh, correspondence between Hayek and von Fricht, uh, but I can right. uh, show the cover of your book. Right. Um, this is your book uh, where you publish the whole story um, of Hayek's attempted biography of Wittgenstein. Right, right. Um, so in the end we uh, made an edition of the of Hayek's draft and also the um, uh, the whole story of how it was abandoned by the and 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 the role that literary executors uh, played in this story. Yeah. Um, there was of interest because uh, it it opened the question for me how uh, to write about the life of Wittgenstein. Um, yeah. And uh, well, the the literary executors, uh, they didn't want Hayek to publish this draft, mainly uh, because they thought that Hayek would not uh, be able to write about the 
philosophy of Wittgenstein and uh, um, writing a biography without philosophical understanding or without understanding of the text that Wittgenstein um, created uh, would be uh, completely uh, out of the uh, out of the question. Yes. So. This was an interesting document in connection with von Richt's archive. Um, just very briefly, uh, then the uh, in connection with Rees, I yeah. sent you also something. Uh, it's not from Swansea, but it's uh, from the Franz Brentano archives in in Graz, in Austria, and this is a very early letter by Rees, um, in which he tells his first philosophical mentor, Alfred Castile, about his attendance of Wittgenstein's classes in 1933, I think. Uh, 19, yes, 33 it was, I think. And uh, here one uh, can read uh, uh, the young Rees talking about Wittgenstein uh, and not really liking uh, Wittgenstein's classes. They, uh, Rees says um, that uh, it, it, the classes miss structure and it's difficult to follow and it's, um, it's, it's only a, a, um, a sequence of similes, I think he writes. So it's in German, but uh, there's also a translation of this. Uh, if you can, uh, there, there's a translation uh, in the publication, I, that I sent to you, Radmila. Uh, it's uh, also in the, the publication, just a moment. Uh, you sent. Yes. Wittgenstein, no, a BBC radio talk, no. No, um, it's in oh, the. Oh, continuity. Yes. Oh, yeah, just a moment. And. So uh, together with these early letters, there, there was also an essay by Rees um, that he probably wanted to make a, a dissertation out of in, in the 30s. And um, this shows that the, uh, work, when you follow uh, the literary executors in their work, um, one is also uh, directed towards their own uh, philosophical work, like here uh, with Rush Rees, long philosophical draft with it, which has not been published before. Mm -hmm. so, um, that was the interest here, that one uh, can find the philosophical work of the literary executors. Um, and this also sheds then light of their uh, personality, of their philosophical convictions, and uh, again sheds light on how they approach the Wittgenstein papers. So understanding these uh, uh, editors as philosophers is also very important. Yeah. Um, now, the third uh, um, document that I brought with me uh, was um, a BBC talk by Elizabeth Anscombe from 1953. Yeah. Uh, and this was broadcasted in, uh, in, in 1953. Uh, there in the correspondence between the literary executors, there's a hint to this uh, radio broadcast. But then actually the BBC archive still had um, and this is what I sent you there. And uh, this is written at a time when Enscom just had finished translating uh, the philosophical investigations. Um, and therefore, uh, she is still very uh, close to this work of translating. And here she is talking uh, uh, yes, from this um, just after this very concentrated work of translating the philosophical investigations. Very interesting what she says here about the literary character of Wittgenstein's work. Um, now, 
All right. Uh, okay, Christian. Uh, yes, I, I, I will, I, uh, I will uh, uh, close it. I just want to show documents like this uh, uh, made the whole thing very interesting uh, and, and uh, a thrilling uh, research adventure, if you want so. And these documents form the basis of the, of the whole book uh, that we are talking about. And they are like uh, uh, little episodes in the, in the whole story. And there, there are lo lots of documents and, and still many, many documents uh, to find and to, to look at. Yes. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, perhaps now um, our other guests who I think uh, have known personally the uh, literary trustees, uh, certainly everybody has known um, Henrik von Fricht, I believe. Uh, but let's, let's begin with David Stern. Uh, the, the coming to this book, the meaning, uh, the significance of this book inside Wittgenstein um, scholarship. Uh, please, David, uh, tell us how you see the things, uh, the topics in this book. Oh, well, uh, I'm thrilled to have been the series editor for this book and thrilled that this is the first in a series of what will be 30 or more short books on every aspect of Wittgenstein's philosophy. And when I was putting this series together, um, it was clear that many of them would have to be on all of the standard topics that are covered in every large collection of uh, you know, introductory essays and companions and handbooks. But uh, Christians was not part of that standard set of topics. It was something that I very badly wanted to include. And I think it provides a really important perspective and one reason for that is the reason that you've just seen in what Christian has to say. I mean, it provides a depth of biographical and uh, archival detail about how Wittgenstein's writings were edited that hasn't been available before. And for those of us on this panel who are really fascinated by the relationship between philosophy and biography and the details of the production of Wittgenstein's work, that already is one huge reason why it needs to be made publicly available. But uh, I got some pushback when I tried to include this title and people uh, who were reviewing the project said, well, do we really need this? What's the point of having this kind of es essay in this kind of collection? And that goes together with a larger view from those who are not already invested in these sorts of philological and uh, editorial questions as to why this is important philosophically. And so what I want to say very briefly is, I think for those who have that kind of skepticism, and I know there are a, a lot of them in the broader world of Wittgenstein studies, let alone philosophy more generally, um, I think it's hard to overstate how large a role the editors have had in our reception of Wittgenstein and how large a role they've had in the production of the texts that we take for granted as things that Wittgenstein wrote. And uh, I think, Part of what Christian does that is of importance from that angle is it allows us to see how Wittgenstein's work has been produced for us. And Christian has been part of a larger project at the University of Helsinki called The Creation of Wittgenstein. And the focus there is very much one that's informed by Christian's work, one that says we can't begin to understand the books that we have unless we understand how the editors created the books that we have and the agendas and interests that they brought. And part of the reason why I strongly recommend that everyone read this book is not just the wonderful detail about how the books were edited, but the insight we get into the respective philosophical perspectives of the editors and the way in which the different uh, interests and agendas shape the books that we now have available and created the Wittgenstein that we read. If you don't take seriously the information that Christian provides here, you will end up following in their footsteps and not appreciating how they've shaped our reception of his thoughts. So I think that's at least one more reason why this is a really important project and one that should reach a very wide readership. Um, so I'm sure we'll talk about that more later, and I'm sure we'll talk more about the other virtues of this book. But that at least is my particular 
uh, introductory thought about why I'm so excited about seeing this uh, in print and us discussing it today. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, Jim, may I ask you? So, um, so maybe two things to say about Chris Jones' book. One, um, in the spirit of your question about Wittgenstein studies and, and how it's useful there, and then more specifically, a thing about the book I find very fascinating, which um, Christian emphasizes throughout his book, but um, I thought I would, I would help him do it um, in a remark. So the first thing is just, it's a very useful book to have, as David was saying, for, for among other things, students, I think. Whenever I try to teach Wittgenstein, you're in a very awkward position because unlike teaching Kant or Husserl or some other famous philosopher, there's many, many published works. People know what those, you know, those are available. And then there's also some nachlas and some other things. They're usually a little harder for the students to get a hold of. Kant's lectures on metaphysics or whatever that have a different sort of status, but um, they're gonna start off by reading the various critiques or the groundwork or something like that. Um, Whereas in Wittgenstein's case, um, there's one book he published in his lifetime, and all the other books they can order or they can uh, find in the bookstore all came into being after he died and came into being in very different ways um, involving different sorts of relations to materials he left behind, um, came into being at very different stages and on very different principles of construction. And one wonderful thing about Chris Jones' book is he just provides an overview and a narrative. It's something you can give a student. They can read fairly quickly, and they just have an understanding of um, now this, ex some sort of understanding of this extremely complicated um, authorship and the way in which that authorship comes to us in the forms that it does and the volumes that it does and the way this was mediated and the way in which the unfolding of the availability of that authorship came about in a way in which the contemporary student does not understand now if they didn't live through all of this. And suddenly there are these dozens and dozens of books of Wittgenstein that they have no idea as it were what was first and what was second and why it came about the way it did. So that's one wonderful thing about Christian's book. It's just the way in which it, it, it gives a narrative which is very readable and very interesting and very perspicuous and synoptic it allows people to have a sense of what the complexity of this authorship is. Something that perhaps people like Alan or Ray or David or I had spending our lives studying these things, but not so easy to communicate quickly and efficiently to the person who's coming um, to these matters for the first time. Um, the second thing I, I thought I would just emphasize in starting a discussion about Chris Jones book is an extremely interesting theme in it. It's not just an interesting theme for Wittgenstein studies, I think it's an interesting theme more generally, which is what is it to edit the corpus of a philosopher? And there's one way of thinking about this is very common, which is um, whatever it is to do that is what it is to do that. And it doesn't really matter who the philosopher is. So there are principles of good editorial production. You wanna respect the manuscripts in the initial form, you get them as much as possible. You do want, you want to enact as little violence as possible. You provide them with a certain kind of editorial apparatus, with an introduction, with scholarly footnotes, with an appendix. And, um, and, and, and that's what it is to do this. And then um, it doesn't matter whether you're editing Kant or James Joyce or really what you're editing. You just bring those principles of good editorial practice to bear on the, you know, on the corpus in question that you acquire. Um, one thing you can see um, from reading Christian's book is that is not at all about the, the three literary heirs went about this. The extent to which they had an understanding of what they're doing and how much it was or was not like that itself was different among the three of them. They're constantly having a conversation about this. Von Richt is probably the person whose conception of what he's doing was a little bit more like, but that's just a matter of degree, that more standard conception of uh, editorial processing and production than the other two. And of course, the situation they were in, as Christian emphasizes, is um, they weren't professional editors who then, as their next project, were handed the remains of some guy named Wittgenstein, who they then had to, as it were, process and produce. On the contrary, he was their teacher, he was a close friend, and he more or less left them 
with some sort of injunction of the form, following form, whatever this means, to sort of translate it out as simply as possible. Please only publish what I would have published in the way I would have published it. Um, and I think for a while, especially Reese, but all three of them were, were struggling with what it means to do this. Um, and of course, in some ways, it's a completely impossible um, um, request. <laughs> it's not clear how one could know these things or adjudicate them. Um, but on the other hand, it, it strongly influenced um, their understanding of what they were doing over t at the beginning. And I think one thing that happened in the production of the authorship is that over time, um, as it became clearer and clearer to them that, you know, there was no way for Wittgenstein, as it were, to see his life's work from the point of view of his death. There is nothing which is being able to do that for a human being. And as more and more decades elapse and more and more things published, their sense of what their responsibility was and the ways in which they could release things changed over time. But I think early on, they felt extremely strongly that the first things they published would strongly shape the reception of Wittgenstein's work. Of course, especially his later work, which um, before they got to work, you know, wasn't officially published at all, but some of it was circulating unofficially. So there's a great deal of discussion of the form. If we publish this first rather than that, or if we publish this without editing it first in just that form, it will lead to enormous misunderstandings or reinforce the idea that he's closer to the Vienna Circle than he is, or, 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 each one of them had a different concern. And so there's a question of, as it were, mediating and shaping the reception of his ideas in the first things that they released. And, um, and then this, of course, involves them in discussions about what it is to be faithful to Wittgenstein, what it is to be the editor of this work, how much they should or should not intervene, to what extent they should be carving and pruning and consolidating the work. Because Wittgenstein, of course, was someone who was constantly reworking his work. And, you know, in some sense, it was, if anything was known, what was known is he wouldn't have just wanted to publish those things as he left them. He hadn't published them because he wasn't happy with how he left them. <laughs> so that's, that's sort of the one thing he knew um, initially. Um, and, um, and, and it's very interesting to see the kind of struggles this imposes. Um, and other people are left in this position, of course, sometimes that they have a close friend who asked them to um, publish their final work or the things they haven't published. And this has happened all kinds of times in philosophy um, among lesser and greater figures. And Christian provides an extreme, his book provides a fascinating insight into what it is to struggle with this question, not just as a question, if you will, about, you know, as it were editorial practice in science, but as a philosophical question about what it is to do this out of a conception of fidelity of a particular philosopher's understanding of what his own authorship was. So, of course, this question asked about Wittgenstein by someone who's responsible for Wittgenstein's work would be a very different thing than somebody who is the literary heir of a Husserl or a Michael Dummett or whoever. So that um, the specificity of that philosopher's conception itself enters into the conception of what, as it were, is um, um, an expression of fidelity to the um, initial injunction to publish that work in the manner and form and order that is in accord with the wishes of the philosopher who's turned this task over to them. And so that's very fascinating to see, I think, in, in Chris John's book, how that drama unfolds in the early decades of the executorship. And then it's also very interesting to see how over time it then transitions into something which is a much more common practice of let's just make everything available and let's preserve it, initially in electronic form, and then also in various forms of text publications based on those electronic forms. But they're only comfortable with doing that sort of thing after a certain amount of time has elapsed, and they've already mediated and shaped of his work in certain ways. So I think that's a very um, interesting drama, both the drama itself and also the way the editor's conception of the project changes. And they also feel that it, it's okay for it to change when certain volumes have come out and a certain kind of reception is already underway and is taking place. Thank you, Jim. Alan? 
Aran, do you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah. Do, you, do you hear me? May I ask you for your initial statement? Uh, because you were involved in more than one way uh, being in Innsbruck uh, in, in proximity to so many documents uh, yourself. Yes, well, that, uh, well let, let me begin by saying I, I find myself now in a position I never thought I would have been in uh, 55 years ago when I began. Uh, and when I began, I think it's a very important part of the story, uh, when, when I entered Wittgenstein studies, there, were, there, there, were, there was very little that counted as Wittgenstein studies. Wittgenstein was a philosopher uh, who was being used aggressively and defensively within philosophy. Nobody was much interested in what happened around Wittgenstein in the state of the text, I mean, except this, this small group which uh, 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 upon whom the, the responsibility for the text devolved. But the discussion, the discussion of Wittgenstein at that time, I think is a very important part of the story that, 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 that doesn't get told. There's no reason to told. There's no reason why it should be, be but it, it, I think it's important to remind people that uh, one knew so little about Wittgenstein. I, I began 1964. I had no intention ever of studying Wittgenstein. I, I had to, and what came out by accident uh, was a, a sort of a new uh, way of looking at Wittgenstein from the point of, of view of German philosophy. Uh, um, which, sorry, could you could you come uh, closer to a micro? Uh, uh, can can, you, can yeah. you not hear me well? Uh, is a that better? better? Yeah, now it's better. Maybe, maybe I can um, can actually turn this up somehow, uh, but I'm not sure how. Uh, in, in any case, uh, I mean, there were all kinds of rumors about Wittgenstein and, 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 and how he had worked, etc. Um, there were there were all, all sorts of rumors about him, uh, as, about his sexuality, for example. That was all discussed. Uh, uh, you know, in the, in the philosophical locker rooms, as I like to call them, uh, and also the the question: Where did he get his ideas? Uh, they were uh, they were so unusual. What what what, what, what had been been, been slipping out uh, from students and so forth? Uh, people believed that Wittgenstein had also uh, some people anyway, uh, all sorts of uh, secret sources. And uh, it was claimed, I actually I heard once a wonderful story about, uh, 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 it was a third hand story, uh, about somebody uh, claiming to have found Witt met Wittgenstein uh, at midnight, more or less carrying a big stack of books, which he had, which he had got, uh, taken out of the Trinity College Library, you see, where, where he would, uh, where, uh, would, would more or less take his ideas out of, and so forth. Uh, we we knew very little. We never there was an early Wittgenstein. That there was that, that there was a late Wittgenstein. Uh, the Tractatus was uh, an object of veneration. I mean, there were people uh, in the days in which uh, in, in which I began in, in, in the mid sixties who had memorized the Tractatus because they thought there was some there was some set of ideas there. Uh, there's, there were some thoughts. The really, really important ones uh, were, 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 were in there, but you, you had to you, you had to put yourself in there somehow. I mean, there are all kinds of other strange things. But, uh, uh, I mean, the, the tractatus is, is, is one of the most uh, mysterious books uh, philosophers ever written. Uh, we know a lot more about it now, but still, still not enough. We're still prepared to fight about uh, various aspects of, of interpretation, uh, as some of us have done. Hello, Jim. <laughs> uh, but, uh, may I ask you, sorry to interrupt, but may I ask you uh, about uh, your um, meetings, your um, relationship with uh, Henrik, uh, Henrik von Fricht, because I know that you knew him quite well, and perhaps uh, he, perhaps you learned a lot from him. Very, very, very long. Uh, once again, he's the one who 
whose uh, support uh, encouraged me to continue. I'd begun working on Wittgenstein Tractatus and Schopenhauer. He's, he was the only person, I think I sent out 25 copies of the, of the article that I'd written on Schopenhauer and Mueller and Wittgenstein. Uh, I got a thank you from Brian McGuinness uh, and nothing from anybody else except the Georg Henrik von Rick, who was visiting professor at, uh, at, at um, uh, Pittsburgh uh, University uh, at that time and visited Philadelphia where I was teaching. We met in 1966. And he said, this is very important what you're doing. There's, there's a whole lot more to Wittgenstein. That's when things began, uh, when my eyes began to open. Uh, so in a very so, uh, strange and, and very strenuous way. Continue what you're doing. This is, this is good work. And we began talking about things like Otto Weininger. Uh, and, uh, and I was very perplexed about what he was saying there, but he he had all he had uh, a great great uh, interest in the background to Wittgenstein, which in fact uh, he saw uh, as, as we have learned over the years to uh, the, the, as, as something very similar to his own, um, the, the, and especially the, the question of, of Spengler. But uh, uh, Georg Henrik was, was uh, the person also who sent me to Innsbruck. When I, I came to Vienna, I came to Vienna with, uh, to, see, to meet Wittgenstein's friends and family. Because again, in the mid 60s, uh, what we knew about Wittgenstein was written by uh, people, uh, of the person uh, was written by people like Norman Malcolm. And you had the idea they wrote it on their knees before an idol. And I wanted to get uh, the impressions of people who knew Wittgenstein, uh, the human being, uh, how, how the, uh, people who, who, who met him on a one-to-one -one basis, um, uh, how, how, they, how they saw him. Well, it turns out almost nobody was on a one-to-one -one basis with him except his family. Um, that's, another, that's, that's another issue. And in, in all of these things, um, uh, Georg Henrik von Richt uh, 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 was, was in the background. As I say, he sent me to Innsbruck. He said the most important thing uh, for your the work you're doing uh, uh, is, uh, are things that are in Innsbruck. He didn't say more. He didn't tell me what these things were. Tip, uh, typical of him. Um, so in in May of 1969, I came to Innsbruck uh, and and found the. Uh, second set of letters that were being published. Uh, the letters from, uh, of Ludwig von Ficker to, to, to Wittgenstein, in which he described the tractatus as, as literary and philosophical, uh, in which he said there's a second part, which is everything I, which consists of everything I haven't written, and so forth, and which, which all of which uh, was fueled to my fires. And it was the keystone. I mean, there would have been, the, the, it would have been a fairly lousy book uh, without that, uh, because it, there, there would have been a, a kind of mishmash. But the, the, this, this text, um, this text that, that Georg Henrik had edited uh, with Walter Metlagel, whom I uh, subsequently worked for 50 years, um, uh, the, the, this, uh, this text uh, was a way into a, 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 a new future, and and all, also for for Dirk Henrik, I remember my 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 uh, initial shock at the commentary. This is just two essays, one by Matt Dogler, one by von Richt, in the in the original edition of those letters, and. The one by Matt Blagel who tells you the story of Deb Renner and how Wittgenstein might have fit in to all of that. Um, by the way, the philosopher, apparently, the philosopher that, um, uh, that, that, that Ludwig von Ficker showed the, the Tractatus to was in all probability Alfred Castile, uh, which makes I mean, the, the connections that, that appeared and reappeared. In any case, uh, in, in any case, the, the, the um, uh, 
uh, the, the, the essay by Georg Henrik von Rick was really the one that floored me, uh, uh, where he begins to talk about the genesis of the Tractatus. I said, my God, I'm, I'm reading biblical scholarship here. Uh, this, this is, I mean, if, if, this, if, if, if this approach to Wittgenstein continues, there's going to be a whole different world out there. And in fact, the, that, 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 is, that is what happened under the, the, the whole process of editing Wittgenstein uh, uh, has, has been uh, so, so complex and so exciting. And, and uh, uh, the, the thing I miss, by the way, in Christian's book is the bitterness that was, was, was often involved. Because I mean, the, Georg Henrik von Richt, for example, was the most discreet man who ever lived, I think. Uh, but he could, when he spoke of, um, of Elizabeth Anscombe, he could, uh, he could express despair without putting it into words. Um, uh, 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 they, they, their misunderstanding uh, went, went very deep uh, uh, and uh, uh, as, 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 as Christian says, uh, I mean, they, 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 they fought with each other, they respected each other, they, they respected above all their task and their duties to, to Wittgenstein. Uh, I think that, that's uh, uh, very important uh, uh, to say. I did, I did not know Rush Rees, I had some correspondence with him uh, when we wanted to publish the, uh, the, the, the thicker letters in English. Um, and uh, I knew somebody who, who spent uh, a good deal of time with him, uh, 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 who said, this, uh, this, this man, for example, if you, if you want something from him, uh, the longer it takes you to get an answer, the more likely it's going to be positive. Uh, that means that uh, you had to work, you had to work. I mean, all of these people were, 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 were in enormously idiosyncratic by, by, by any standards that I would call normal. They were, not, they were not simple people to work with. Elizabeth Anscombe, I mean, she could cut you in half, uh, uh, you know, with a comma. Uh, in, in, the, in, in, the, in the discussion, she, 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 was, she was very tough, she was very brilliant, and she, and she could be very, very kind. Um, uh, not, not, every, not everybody, on the other hand, uh, had been able to work with her. Uh, so that around all of, all of this, uh, there, was, there was always an awful lot, an awful lot of tension. Um, the, the, the attitudes, as I understand them, of, of the three are, de are depicted in Christian's book quite well, quite well. They're, 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 I mean, Georg Henrik had his, his cultural uh, interest that the others did not share. And this is because, I mean, Georg Henrik's own prehistory is a complicated one. Uh, he, he was a, a Swedish speaking, he was part of the Swedish speaking aristocracy and not for nothing, he got this family at the title Tom, which he took very, uh, to be very important is his great grandfather and his bro and, and brother, they were both famous painters in, in Finland. I mean, they, this was the Finnish aristocracy. When the queen came to Finland, uh, she was received by Georg Henry because, it was the, because they couldn't find anybody more important. In, in Thank you, Alan. M might I uh, go now further <clears throat> because you're talking about biography and uh, uh, next we have uh, Wittgenstein's biographer Wittgenstein's biographer and if uh, I, I have only two, two things to, to say first to uh, regarding biography and uh, um, testimonials of uh, contemporaries uh, uh, for Christian, the Stomborough family, Pierre and Francois Stomborough read your book, uh, and uh, they are not involved in any research uh, or, or uh, scholarship, but uh, they loved the book, would like to meet you very much when you come next to Austria, 
but uh, Pierre Stomborough, as a teenager, uh, met all the trustees uh, when they visited Margaret Stomborough at the Villa Toscana in Gmurden. And uh, he said, I was very young, I couldn't ask them or converse with them about anything. I only remember that there are no two more different people in the world than Elisabeth Anscombe and Henrik von Fricht. How these two ever came together, we couldn't understand. This I wanted to say. And uh, um, uh, Ray, uh, may I uh, only say, I, um, this book has a lot of biography in it. Uh, and uh, um, is there such a thing as biography continuing, continuing after the death of a, such a great person as Wittgenstein? Because exactly he, uh, continues to live uh, through his uh, nachlas uh, and uh, the people who who form uh, his uh, reputation his uh, his writings uh, his uh, the, the understanding of his work so isn't this the case that uh, wittgenstein's biography is still going on please okay thank you thank you radmila yeah i think um i th why aren't i going in the middle of the screen Sorry. Oh, maybe I am. Um, anyway, thank you very much. Your, your questions um, do lead in nicely to what I wanted to talk about. First of all, I wanted to congratulate Christian on a very fine book. It's a very good book indeed. Um, it sheds a lot of light, I think, on the, the rather odd nature of the nutlass that Wittgenstein has left us with. And also the equally odd nature of what we know now as the works of Ludwig Wittgenstein. Um, I think what Christian does a very good job of making clear is the extent to which many of these works on certainty, philosophical remarks, philosophical grammar, also reflect the particular oddities and characteristics of the very different people uh, who Wittgenstein nominated as his executors. But in addition to shedding scholarly light on Wittgenstein's Nachlass and philosophy, there's another aspect of the book which hasn't been mentioned much so far, but which interests me a great deal, and you touch on it, Radmiller, which is that it tells a very interesting human story. It's a human story about three very different people, von Richt, uh, Anscombe, Ries, each of whom were very different in, as philosophers, as people, and each of whom had a very different relationship with Wittgenstein. And yet, the three of them were given by Wittgenstein the task of, to, of accomplishing what he himself had failed to accomplish during his lifetime. In one way, I think that was never going to end well. And I think Christian does a good job of explaining the difficulties, some of which involved this human story of the relationship between these three very different people. And I thought, uh, and this is a partial answer to something you've asked me, Radmila, I thought it might be helpful and uh, of some interest if I shared my experiences of working with these three when I was uh, writing my biography. Um, because that too shed some light on the differences between these three people in a way that complements what Christian has has written. First of all, von Richt, I never met, I never met him. Um, I would write to him and he would always reply punctually and his replies would always be extensive and they would always be helpful and he was a perfect gent and when I wrote to him I, I sent all of them a list of the parts of the unpublished Wittgenstein text that I wanted to quote in my book, he replied immediately saying, yes, you can quote all of these. And he was, he was tremendously helpful. Um, the other two were also helpful, but in very different ways. Um, so Anscombe had made public her uh, antipathy towards any biography of, of, of Wittgenstein, and yet she put no barriers in the way of me writing my biography at all. I wrote to her when I was commissioned to, to, to write the book, I wrote to Anscombe and said, you know, I've just been commissioned to write a biography of, uh, of Wittgenstein, can I meet you to discuss it? Um, she replied, inviting me to her college room, and to begin with, she was very um, formal. The meeting lasted three hours, 
in which she tested my knowledge of Wittgenstein, she tested my knowledge of, of, of philosophy, uh, she engaged me in philosophical argument, and I don't know how, but I somehow managed to pass that test because after about two and a half hours, she became a completely different person. She relaxed, she was, uh, uh, she, she was chatty, she was even quite gossipy. Um, oh yeah, there she is. Um, and after that, she was very kind and she, she invited me to her house. She had various collections of things in her own possession. She hadn't surrendered everything to the Wren Library. And one of the things she had in her own possession was a box of letters that Skinner, Francis Skinner had written to Wittgenstein. She invited me to her house uh, to let me take notes from these, uh, from these letters. And I would go to her house, I'd spend all day transcribing things from it. And she would cook me lunch, which was quite an experience. Uh, the lunch was all, always um, something very simple. It might be, um, you know, two sausages and some mashed potato or something like that. Um, and the house was chaos um, because I think Geach and Anscombe had seven children. They were grown up by that time, but there were always people wandering in and out. And uh, Geach, my memory of Geach is that he was always talking, uh, whether anybody was listening or not. And I would be chatting with, with Anscombe about, let's say, Wittgenstein and Skinner. Geach would be on the other side of the room giving what appeared to be a, a lecture on Maxwell and Faraday, it was one, one, one day, um, to, to nobody listening at all. But one thing that struck me about Anscombe, and this uh, Christian mentions this a few times in his book, is her attitude to scholarship. As we know, uh, some of the manuscripts that were put in the, uh, uh, in the trust of Anscombe and Rees have gone missing. She wasn't, to my memory, she wasn't at all concerned about that. She once described the scholarly desire to look at original sources as a fetish. She had no respect for it whatsoever. Uh, my last memory of, of Anscombe was, uh, as I say, I wrote to them giving a list of things that I wanted to quote and asking for their permission to, to quote these things, including some of the coded remarks, by the way. Um, all three of them replied saying, yes, you can quote. But then, just as the book was about to go into press, I got a second letter from Anscombe. She had by this time uh, become very forgetful. And it was a heart stopping moment because I opened the letter and it said, um, with regard to your request to, to, to quote from these uh, sources, I thought, oh no. She said, um, I can't remember whether I've written this or not, but uh, my, my permission is hereby granted. <laughs> So uh, now, Rees. Rees was different again. He was, he was quite phenomenally kind. Um, he would invite me to Swansea. He would pay for a hotel room for me within walking distance of his house. I would walk up to his house by about nine o'clock in the morning and we would spend the whole day discussing Wittgenstein. Um, and I think this ties into something that Christian uh, dwells on in his book which is that one of the things that influenced the way Rees edited um, uh, Wittgenstein's work was his concern to stave off misinterpretations of Wittgenstein's work. And I think that was also a large part of his motivation in spending so long talking to me about Wittgenstein. I think he wanted to take the opportunity to, as it were, influence my understanding and interpretation of Wittgenstein. We spent a great deal of time discussing the philosophical grammar, for example, but he was also very helpful. He had, he had, um, he had drawers full of notes of his conversations with Wittgenstein and he would, uh, you know, if, if it was relevant to what we were discussing, he would go into his room, pull out uh, some of these notes and show them to me, allow me to, uh, to, uh, transcribe, uh, you know, to copy things from them. Um, and he would also share with me his memories of Wittgenstein. Um, so all three of them actually were very kind and helpful, but I think the ways in which they were kind and helpful were very different and very different in ways that Christian has done a, a lot to describe, explain, and rather vividly and sometimes quite movingly make clear. So thank you, Christian. Uh, thank you, Ray. 
That's um, it. That's it. That's all you have to say. May, may I ask you again about uh, the biography continuing? Uh, oh yes, I didn't get biography on to that. <laughs> after the death of a great person. No. Yeah, I mean, of course. Um, sometimes it occurs to me that what I should do is a revised edition of my book, because, well, I mean, one way in which a biography of a dead person keeps as it were, continuing, is that we keep discovering new sources, new things come to light and so on. And I'm, there's something in me that is tempted to, to rewrite the book, to in, incorporate all of that. But I'm very nervous about doing that, partly because revisions of biographies almost never improve on the original. I'm thinking of Holroyd's biography of Lytton Strachey, uh, the original edition of which I think is far better than the, the revised edition. So I'm worried that if I wrote a revised edition, I would end up writing a book that just isn't as good. Um, so what I'm hoping would happen is somebody else would take on the job of writing a biography of Wittgenstein, incorporating some of this new material, incorporating some of the things we've learned about Wittgenstein. And as it were, um, in, 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 your, uh, in, in the spirit of your remarks, uh, Rad Miller, uh, continuing the biography of Wittgenstein, because, you know, I certainly don't regard my book or McGuinness's book as the last word. I don't think there can be a last word on, on, on something, but I think the next word on Wittgenstein probably shouldn't be written by me. Well, that's a pity. Many people <laughs> will expect something different. Um, <laughs> But n not least, uh, many documents come to light. Uh, exactly. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, if if I may say, well, from... but somebody somebody will come along, Rad Miller, and, and use these documents and and produce a, uh, you know, um, an interesting new take on Wittgenstein's life. I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, I I would uh, just want to mention this doesn't have. Um, much to do with uh, Christian's book, but uh, um, even Christian's book w will have to have a continuation because time time yeah. goes by, and uh, yeah. But uh, I, I think in in the years since the publication of uh, your biography and of McGuinness's biography, uh, a lot of uh, research has been done in Austria uh, regarding the time, the Wittgenstein's uh, Wittgenstein's times, and I don't mean uh, only Wittgenstein's Vienna, uh, but rather economical um, history of, uh, of Austria, of Austrian society, of Jewish society. Th this is a, a future topic I would very much uh, would like to, to pick up uh, also in English. We have uh, done it with Austrian histor uh, historians because uh, um, the more I know about Wittgenstein's biography, the more I have the feeling that he was very Austrian. Uh, much more yeah. Austrian than people assume because he was, of course, he didn't talk about himself or about his inner life. He was a mysterious, discreet person. Yeah. But uh, uh, his character that has been so widely discussed in Cambridge's difficult, arrogant, uh, um, overbearing, whatever, this was the family. And this was the entire class to which his family belonged. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, yeah I no, just, I, I, I think that's right. And, and actually, it was a big moment for me when I was a graduate student at Oxford. I read Alan's book, Wittgenstein's Vienna. And that was a big moment in my understanding of Wittgenstein, because I think uh, um, what uh, Yannick and Tulman did was to make it clear to English speaking people that it was no good trying to fit Wittgenstein into the tradition of British culture and British life, that there was an important sense in which he was a very Austrian figure, as you were just saying, Rad Miller. And this, this goes for his family. And I think we've, we've in, in the years since my book was published, we've learned a lot more about his family and about his role in his family. The family correspondence has been, has been published. Um, and I think, I mean, if there is to be another biography of Wittgenstein, I hope it'll say far more about music than I managed to say in my book, because one thing that's clear and one important respect in which he's a very Austrian figure is his taste in music yeah. and the role, that, the role that music played in his life. 
I think that's terribly important, and I think not enough has been written about it. Yeah, there, there, uh, there is a problem between musicologists, music historians, and uh, uh, philosophers, the same as uh, Christian uh, mentioned yesterday, between um, uh, psychologists and philosophers, when you are trying to accord uh, your current activity with Wittgenstein's philosophy, that uh, the ones don't know how well they can use the others. And yeah. the same is with mu music historians and philosophy. They don't know each other and don't want to meet each other yet. Yeah, yeah. No, that, that's true. And I, you know, I think there's a lot to be said that hasn't been said about the cultural musical background of Wittgenstein and his family and their role in Austrian society and Austrian culture. Yeah. In, I, the mean, in the meantime, with regard to philosophy, academic philosophy, Wittgenstein's influence in English speaking philosophy has, has been plummeting in the last 10 or 20 years. Um, which I, I, I mean, a lot, I know a lot of Wittgensteinian philosophers are in despair about this. But I think there's a silver lining to that, which is that the temptation to pretend that Wittgenstein writes in the same milieu as Quine or Davidson would grow less and in its place would be a recognition of the importance of literature and art and music. Yeah, which is a, also a very Austrian thing. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, before because, because uh, what you just said, Ray, I I have the feeling that uh, Marjorie Perloff and uh, Daniel Moyal Sharok will want to say something about and uh, uh, and ask questions and discuss. But before we go to the Q and A, I would like to uh, come back to to David's turn. Uh, David, there was a considerable uh, um, philosophical aspect that you wanted to address. Uh, in in our talk today about the philosophical implications, Some, something was said uh, already. But uh, would you like to add something? Uh... Well, I'm not sure I have anything precisely further to add. I mean, I think what Jim said was very helpful in terms of developing some of the themes and issues that Christian addresses and making it clear to our audience how this material connects. I mean, I just think it, there's a real, I mean, I totally agree with Ray and Alan that it's very important to understand Wittgenstein's cultural context and to understand the broader uh, significance of Wittgenstein's work in ways that uh, some professional philosophers are blind to. Um, but I, I think that, you know, one of the great virtues of Christian's book is that it really, um, it helps us to see how authorship is uh, a product of not just Wittgenstein's own intentions, but the way in which his uh, editors produce the texts that we read. And uh, it's not that there is some straightforward uh, conclusion P that follows from this in terms of, well, now we can see that some particular thesis frequently attributed to Wittgenstein is false, but rather that there's a great deal that we'll miss about reading Wittgenstein and a great deal that you won't see about the way in which his work develops and the way in which his work has been presented to us if you just take the uh, supposed books at face value. This goes back to what Jim was saying about how we're all used to reading the works of an author who gets to publish his writing during his lifetime. And I think it's very difficult for philosophers in particular who tend to take texts at face value to see the extent to which what Wittgenstein wrote is actually uh, the product of an author function that is largely the result of decisions by his uh, editors. And to not be aware of that is to fall into various kinds of naive response to the text. And I think one of the wonderful things about Christian's book is that it really enables you to do that for yourself. It's not that uh, he uh, does anything as simple as leading us to another philosophical reading so much as to give us the tools we need to read the text more skillfully and subtly. And I, I think maybe the best way to bring this out actually is just to, if I may, read a paragraph from 
the very beginning of the book, where he frames this for the reader in a way that is wonderfully accessible and at the same time really brings up the central problem that I think he wants readers to think about. And this is from the very first section of the text, the, just after the introduction, he writes, imagine that you have inherited the papers of your philosophical mentor and have been instructed to publish from them what you think fit. And indeed, that is what his uh, editors were asked to do. What are your guidelines for deciding what to publish? Would you try to think about what your mentor would have consented to publishing? Or would you maybe consult an archivist or scholarly editor who could tell you how to handle your deceased mentor's writings in a professional way? If you choose the latter, would it irritate you that your mentor appointed you for the task and not an institution with a professional staff? Would passing on the task to a professional do justice to your mentor's will? By the same token, if you choose to let your own judgment rule, which parts of your mentor's writings should be made available and would your justification suffice? If your mentor is a philosopher of considerable interest, would it be irresponsible not to follow the method recommended by professional scholarly editors? But then again, what does professional mean in the context of your mentor's philosophy? And one other thing that I think comes out very clearly in Christian's story is that the era of the three uh, appointed editors is over. They are now all deceased and the uh, texts have all now been reprocessed by a second generation of editors. The Bergen Archive has given us an electronic edition of everything. And a new way of publishing, which is much closer to the professional and much more distant from the appointed uh, students and friends. And uh, one of the things that Christian's book helps us to see is that, you know, we all can now think about what are the appropriate guidelines for editing and publishing Wittgenstein's philosophy in the next 50 years. Uh, so that, that, that's at least part of what I think is really valuable about his book in a way in which it should all help us think uh, in a slightly more well-informed way about these questions. So I'm not sure if that precisely responds to what you wanted to ask, Ramila, but I hope it's helpful. No, no, uh, I, I just knew that uh, you would uh, that you would uh, uh, like to ask to add your very personal perspective on the book, uh, and uh, and before we start with the questions and answers with the further discussion, uh, let's just uh, um, um, uh, talk about the future of this uh, Cambridge element because you are the editor in chief uh, of this Cambridge element, Wittgenstein's philosophy. Uh, perhaps you would like to say a few words what we are to, ex to expect further. A new installment has just been uh, published, I saw a few days ago. Right, so uh, yes, today is the last day for anyone who would like to download Avner Bass's book on uh, Wittgenstein on Aspects from the Cambridge Elements site. And so this is a really an experiment in a different kind of scholarly publishing. And the thought is that uh, these are going to be uh, pamphlets longer than an article, but shorter than a normal book, with a top limit of 30,000 words. And uh, so in some ways, this series of Wittgenstein elements is uh, going to eventually be a reference work, something like a companion or a handbook. Uh, unlike those, uh, because it's an electronic medium, uh, individual contributions are rather longer. Um, so it's an interesting new medium. It's a new way of making uh, reference or scholarly material on a wide range of topics available. The Elements project is a really large one that Cambridge is working on. There will ultimately be elements on everything. I can tell you that the biggest bestseller in the Elements series this year is the philosophy of immunology. That's been really big. Uh, as you might expect in this COVID year. Uh, I'm not sure any of the Wittgenstein elements are going to uh, prosper quite like that, but uh, we hope that they'll make uh, resources available for people to uh, consult and they'll be particularly useful, as Jim was suggesting, for students and uh, in classes and as a way of uh, providing uh, resources for people to think about Wittgenstein. Uh, and so, the, I mean, in some ways, Christians is a very unusual book in the series. Nearly all of the others will be primarily focused on uh, interpreting particular texts and particular themes in Wittgenstein's philosophy. 
and most of the rest of the list will look much like what you will have seen if you've looked at element at handbooks or companions or other such collections of essays. Uh, so that, that's just a little bit about the broader context in terms of this series and uh, that, that's the story. Okay, uh, then may I uh, uh, ask our two uh, guests, um, uh, Daniel Moyal Sharok, president of the uh, British Wittgenstein Society. And yes, I'm Marjorie. Yeah, just at the video. You turned the video off. Uh, I, I turned the video off. No, no. Ah, here you are. <laughs> Hi. Because I, 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 I know with uh, certainty that Marjorie has something to ask, uh, which would interest certainly David very much, because the, the sogenannten Geheime Tagebücher. Uh, but also, certainly uh, also Daniel, so welcome. I only want to say to our YouTube live stream uh, auditorium, we have at the moment 30 people following the videos, but there are no questions in the live chat, uh, chat on YouTube, um, except one question, what would Wittgenstein say about COVID-19, which I think <laughs> we may also, uh, yeah. it might be a troll, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Why doesn't Danielle go first? Yeah. Okay, sure. Well, I would like to say something to Ray, um, with respect to what Ray said about Wittgenstein's reputation plummeting. So it'd be nice if Ray were here. Ray, are you there? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I'm sorry, that, Ray, that you've not changed your mind since the, um, the, 10th, the 10th British Wittgenstein Society anniversary, where you also maintain that Wittgenstein's reputation is plummeting in the Anglo-Saxon world. I absolutely disagree with, it, with this. I think his influence is significantly uh, increasing, especially in the past 10, 15 years, but not only uh, before that. Uh, not only within philosophy, where um, you know, uncertainty has infiltrated mainstream epistemology um, with something we now call hinge epistemology, which is uh, really doing wonders in epistemology and attracting uh, uh, many uh, mainstream epistemologists. But also inactivism is very uh, strong and um, uh, in philosophy and, of, and, and in the various disciplines that inactivism influences. So uh, in activism, the etern in philosophy, uh, in activism, embeddedness, extensiveness, and so on, uh, very much due to Wittgenstein, I think, and I've argued that Wittgenstein is the first an activist. So um, uh, proponents like Dan Hutto, who are Wittgenstein, Wittgenstein scholars, or Sean Gallagher, who's Wittgenstein influenced, but th you know, this is something that's, that's very, very uh, going strong, and certainly Wittgenstein is found um, increasingly also in non-philosophical disciplines, um, primatology, evolutionary linguistics, ed sciences of education, psychology, particularly on memory, autism, and so on. I mean, he is very, very, um, you know, he, he was, there was a time where he wasn't, and he, he, his um, uh, reputation had plummeted, but I think that we're over it now, and we're going, um, you know, stronger and stronger. Well, Wittgenstein is. Um, I, if I can say, uh, uh, just um, address um, another point it, on, on the difficulty of editing uh, Wittgenstein. Uh, I found interesting Jim's point about, about that and uh, attempting to render something that Wittgenstein would have been happy with, especially, you know, the, the, um, the three editors being as different as they are, as Ray also um, mentioned. Um, but of course, I think we can agree that however difficult, they have substantially succeeded. And that is uh, not only because they're good, <laughs> but because to a greatest extent, the manuscripts speak for themselves. They have to, um, and what they, in order for, for them to have succeeded, what they say imposes itself, imposed, I think, itself on the editors. Um, the success of the editors, um, 
you know, that in spite of their different approaches, give us a very coherent understanding of Wittgenstein. Um, I think um, in spite of their different approaches, yes. Um, the, the genius comes through. And if it hadn't come through, we wouldn't all be sitting here tonight. There is something about, uh, uh, you know, what Wittgenstein says that they got, they got it because it's there. And uh, not because they did, they did, you know, a great job at editing, but it's, it's Wittgenstein we have to thank for. We, we have to thank for that. So I, I think the manuscripts speak for themselves in their coherence, where this coherence actually, um, includes and respects his development, of course. But the, the Korean has to come from the work. It doesn't come from the editors. The genius is what makes it that we're all sitting here tonight. It doesn't come from the editors. It comes from the manuscripts. So uh, there's something I, I don't agree with, with, with Jim when, when um, he says that he, the fact that he didn't publish any more than he did means that he wasn't happy with his work. I don't think we can say that. I think that we have to remember Wittgenstein was fastidious about his work, but also as Ray says in his book, he was fastidious about publication. And I think the post tractatus Wittgenstein would never say he was happy with his work or with anything for that matter. But, uh, you know, he didn't burn his manuscripts. He handed them over to be published. And I think that speaks a lot uh, for, for, for what he thought of his manuscripts. I think he thought a great deal of good uh, about his work. I That's didn't say I the thing that you just said I said. I did not say Wittgenstein was not happy <laughs> with his work. What I said was he clearly did not want it published in exactly the form that he left it. He wanted it in some way. Okay. Edited. Okay, and, sorry and that, if I miss, I miss. Editors were the problem, okay. which was to do the thing that the, a certain kind of archivalist would have done, which is to say, Notebook 17.3, sorry, to 17.3, yeah. just published, was the one thing they knew he was asking them not to do. But obviously, he was, was very important to him. This work got out, which no, is why you did, you did say he wasn't happy. Out. But you did say, I, I, I wrote it down, as you said, it, that he wasn't happy with it, otherwise he would have published it, or something to that. To that uh, well, that the something but, but, uh, to that effect, I, I, I got it you. a little bit here. The, what it was, it had to do with the precise form. Okay, I, and, I and take that, your point. And task, which wasn't just the archival was done. Yeah. But obviously, he cared about nothing more than, you know, his work getting yeah. out and his having preserved it. And um, so the thing that you ascribed to me, I did not say, Daniel. Okay. Apologies that if I misunderstood you. Marjorie? Oh, thank you, Redmill. I want to first of all thank everybody for the wonderful talks. Very interesting. And I want to say to, to Ray, even if you don't do the biography over, it should be, it has to be, look, look at this falling apart. This is the second <laughs> copy I have. And there's something about the book binding. Look at this. I have a very hard time reading it. You see that? And, and it's not that I do terrible things to books. I don't have any other book that is in that state. But, and of course, it's very much read. But look at the copy. You've got to get them. To, you see that? I have to hold it up like that. Anyway, that, so I'm um, very interested in this because I'm, I'm going to be editing. I feel presumptuous. I don't think they actually believe. Oh, I'm sorry. The television just won. <laughs> How did that happen? I pressed something. Damn, CNN went on. It's not lovely. And <laughs> anyway, um, I'm going to be editing the Geheime Tagebücher, and, and I've, trans I've already finished the translation pretty much, and the annotation. Annotation is much easier these days because of, of Google, I have to say. For instance, there's a place where he says, got a postcard from Arnie, and I had no idea who Arnie, A-R-N-E was. And I couldn't find it in, in your book, Ray. I couldn't find it in McIntyre. Uh, uh, anyway, then I just went online and put in Wittgenstein's friend Arnie, and of course it's the young Norwegian man, I forgot his last name now, but I have it, who was 17, whom Wittgenstein met in, in his year in Norway, and, and gave the, um, the cottage to, you know, deeded the cottage to him, so, okay, but that's a little thing, but um, I, um, 
I thought I, what I found that was very peculiar was this. I'm a literary person, not a philosopher. And perhaps because I am a literary person and my main field is poetry, can, difficult modern poetry. And I just have a new book coming out from Chicago on that, on kind of micro poetics that I, I um, think we haven't talked enough about what a problem the translation, the translations are. I'm Viennese, so I really do see that. And even though I left as a child, I speak a colloquial, wenn ich Deutsch spreche, spreche ich so wie ein braves kleines Mädchen, etc. But um, I do know, you know, the colloquial German. And I think all these works really, I mean, I'm not going to do any of it. I think a lot of it should just be retranslated because it is written in this very stilted English. Uh, Ray, when you translate things, which I take it yourself, they, they're fine. But when you, let's say you get to the lecture on aesthetics, and that first page about coffee, uh, as if one said what coffee tasted better, almost too ridiculous for words. That's the translation. Nobody speaks that way. Does anybody talk that way? Almost too ridiculous for words. They, they do in Oxford. What? They do what? in Oxford. <laughs> they do in Oxford. Right. <laughs> exactly. So they really, I found, and this is how I, I came to be to be doing this edition. I was just one day lazily reaching in my bookcase and I started looking at the Geheime Tagebücher in the bound translation, which I take it, where is, where is, uh, oh, here's uh, Christian, is, is, you know, completely corrupt and, and many of the words are wrong and all that. And it went out of print, but I have it, you know, and I think actually he gets kind of a bad deal. It is full of errors and full of just wrong transcriptions that his wife evidently made in the library. He said she went to the library and she transcribed words completely wrong, but still, I mean, it's there. And I couldn't understand why there was none in English. And I started looking around and I thought, how come there's no English edition of the Geheime Tagebuch? I mean, uh, Ray quotes, I would say, you know, some of the choice bits and, and McGinnis quotes other choice bits. They've been quoted by plenty of people, but there's a lot that isn't quoted. And if you read it straight, it also gives you a very different sense. After all, the Tractatus is being written in the first version in Notebook 1914, 16, at the same time on the right side of the page and on the left side of the page, the code, coded notebooks. Now the code was decoded long ago, but um, thank God, but um, you know, why hasn't, why hadn't it appeared? And all I could figure out when I looked into it and I told the publisher this, Liverite is gonna publish it, it's a very good publisher, and, you know, um, is that um, there are two Wittgensteins in a way. There's the English Wittgenstein and there's the Austrian Wittgenstein, uh, who is less prominent in a way. The English Wittgenstein, there's the idea of philosophy doesn't have anything to do with biography really, or shouldn't. And, and, and Christian quotes, I think Christian, you quote Elizabeth Anscombe as saying if she could press a button so there wouldn't be anything known about his personal life, she would be very happy. You know, and that one doesn't need in philosophy what what point do, is there in knowing about the personal life? That's not really important. And the Austrian Wittgenstein is sort of the other, beginning with Wittgenstein's Vienna, with Alan's wonderful book, which I just reread too in its new in its later edition, um, where there is the interest in culture and 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 what milieu he came out of and all that. Uh, now. The English uh, were not particularly interested in having the Geheime Tagebücher done, I think. I mean, I can't figure out why there was, there has not been, an, it had not been an addition, but because they don't want these personal things, his homosexuality, uh, his talking about masturbation, which he does all the time in the Geheime Tagebücher, his love for David, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so much read. The Austrians, on the other hand, first of all, are not very interested in English editions. Why should they be? I mean, they're reading him in German, in Innsbruck. And um, so they're not really looking for a new English edition. And also, I think, again, there's a kind of, um, I ran into a kind of, um, what shall I say, prudery that, uh, for instance, um, Ilse Samavila, who has done a wonderful, who, who has done a wonderful job transcribing, and her essay on on the um, problem of the manuscripts is very good. But she does again not want to talk about the homosexuality. Now, it's not that my job is queering people. I'm not in that branch of criticism, although of course it's been done to every other writer and so forth. But I think it plays a big part 
even in the philosophy and the way Wittgenstein thinks, and in, in now gradually, very slowly translating, the main thing you catch or notice is how contradictory Wittgenstein was in these years. And, and I was not somebody who believed in the resolute theory of the Tractatus, but as I'm reading it, I come down more to it because he really, he'll say, ich kann nicht, heute nicht gearbeitet, uh, das erlösende Wort never comes, das erlösende Wort, which is very hard to translate, the redeeming word. I don't know how you feel about that. I hope you'll say the revelatory word, whatever. But that word never quite comes. And then when he starts in again, there's a notebook missing. And when he's at the front in 1916, where he then is in battle, then he starts writing those things like the sense of the world must be outside the world. And, and it, there's a real strange break. And it's very interesting, but I do think one of the general problems about Wittgenstein's reception has been that is Wittgenstein a Cambridge philosopher primarily, or is he primarily Austrian? I tend to agree with Rad Miller that um, I think the Austrian has been played down, and I say that as an Austrian, but as basically an American. But I do think, um, and it's not so much because of the things the family did. I don't think it's that. I think it's the it's the particular class sense in Austria that hasn't really been talked about that much in relation to Vienna. He's a terrible snob, but so are all the others. I mean, the main thing when he enlists as a foot soldier, he enlists as an ordinary soldier thinking, all right, well, I can do this, you know, and so forth. And then of course he can't stand the people he has to be on the ship with, on the Goplana with, die Gemeinheit, die schreckliche Gemeinheit, die Grässlichkeit, you know, he's full of how terrible the people are. He wants to like them in a way, but he absolutely can't. And that was, you know, that was die Leute, die Leute, which is very hard. It's not really quite the people. It's the mass. It's the, the rabble, you know, and so forth. He has a very hard time with that. He gets better about it as he goes along. But there's that sen sense of becoming a different person as an individual and very little of a community sense, let's say, which I think in England was very different again. So um, I think work for the, in the future, and I wonder what Christian thinks, I think m a, more should really be done on what it meant to be an Austrian at that time. And of course, I think one of the reasons he, he wanted to get away from Vienna so much and hated going home even for Christmas is was def very difficult for him being gay. Not that there wasn't, there weren't plenty of gays in Vienna as they were at Cambridge, but because Wittgenstein had been brought up in a family and I was brought up in that kind of family where you don't ever talk about things like that. You're never going to talk about that openly so that the Christmases with the family were all based on, you know, other kinds of things and you could never openly, you know, talk about it. Although Wittgenstein really wasn't that secret about it after a while. So, um, uh, and when the Bartley book came out and people were so furious and Elizabeth Anscombe, I take it, was furious and they really tried to get it from being published. I'm not so much even defending that book. I don't know what he did with Boys in the Pata or that it matters, but there are even references in the Geheime Tagebücher, there are plenty of references toward the end where he says, ich, ich wieder eine Sünde, es war wieder eine Sünde, and where he's always talking about that he's done, he wants to love God, he reads Tolstoy, all that, but there are always those moments where um, he's done something bad. Now, I don't know whether he went up, picked up somebody, whatever, at night, you know, and had sex with them. And, and it's not that we have to discover that, but it certainly affects his sensibility. How could that not affect your sensibility? And it also does affect his philosophy in all kinds of ways that probably haven't really been talked about yet and that are not just personal kinds of, you know, bad gossip or something like that, but they are relevant to the way he thinks and the way he develops things. And it must have been always a load for him throughout his life, actually. That may, may oh, stop I, there. Stop there. Uh, th thank you. Thank you so much, uh, because they, uh, I, I think you might have uh, ruffled quite a few feathers. Uh, I saw Alan uh, <laughs> moving around. But m first of all, David, because uh, the, the Geheime Tagebücher, which I'm not Geheime Tagebücher, is a topic uh, in Christian's book. And I asked Christian yesterday and he told me uh, it was David's uh, direction that he took uh, in his book uh, regarding the publication and future publications. Yeah, David. Yeah, no, th this is a great topic. And it sort of goes to 
cut against Daniel's suggestion that the texts all speak for themselves, and it's just Wittgenstein talking. The Kahima Tagebuch are a wonderful example of an editorial creation. Um, it's not something that Wittgenstein decided would be produced. It's something that someone thought ought to be produced. And the reason it's not been reprinted it was, is that it was unauthorized. This is something that the trustees strongly thought wasn't appropriate to publish. And so now we're right in the issues that Christian is talking about, about how do you deal with your teacher's writings? And it's entirely understandable that uh, the Wittgenstein trustees didn't think that the more personal coded remarks should be published when they did publish the so-called notebooks 1914-16. Um, and I actually have been, like Marjorie, working on a translation, but I don't think the right way to do it is to say, here is the secret diaries, the translation of the Geheim Tagebuch. I think what we really need is a translation of Wittgenstein's 1914-16 notebooks that includes both his philosophical and his personal writing. I mean, none of this is really secret or shocking. I mean, thanks to Ray, all of the most quote unquote shocking parts of the secret diaries are available in his biography. And I think it's now, you know, a long time since anyone was surprised by anything in this material. I mean, I think Marjorie's right. What really is missing is that there's a continuity and a much more interesting detailed story of his life uh, that he records in this diary material that ought to be available. But I think it would, you know, obviously, if you want to publish just the diary material separately, that's a legitimate editorial choice you can make. Um, but speaking for myself, I think it really belongs as part of the three manuscripts that were selected from in the edition we currently have. So yes, a wonderful example of how the editors created Wittgenstein and how they chose to make certain things into books, and of course, certain things not into books. Um, so yeah, I, I too have actually translated all of this material and I'm working towards publishing it. And as far as I can tell, the single biggest problem is that um, the uh, current copyright ownership belongs to Trinity College. And I was in negotiation with Trinity about publishing this material, um, an edition of all of this pre-Tractatus manuscripts, and this is actually where COVID becomes relevant. Since COVID, the uh, Trinity trustees have gone offline and uh, uh, I actually have no idea what's going on on that front. I don't know if you've had more success reaching them or getting them to approve your project. But uh, at the moment, my understanding is that uh, we're waiting for them to, to respond to us. So anyway, some thoughts about this. Yeah, yeah. Let me may I just make one point there, uh, Brad Miller, but the 1914-16 notebook, at least in the United States, is only available in that University of Chicago edition, which is 1970-something, 1973, I have it right here. So that tells you something, too. I mean, that's 50 years ago. There has not been a new edition, and it, and it doesn't sell much, and I, I predict it'll soon go out of print. That Chicago edition, I have it right here. This is it, Notebooks 1914-16. Yeah, you can. I mean, that was published by Chicago. I've asked Alan Thomas, who's my editor. I published with Chicago. And, uh, you know, how come? I mean, it hasn't even been brought up to date. The second edition, von Richt Anscombe and so forth, University of Chicago Press. And that is 1979. 1979. 89, 99, 09, 19, that's 40, more than 40 years ago. So I agree with you that actually it should be the whole thing. And I, I tried to, I'm going to try to solve the problem in mine by when the two start coming together, by then I'm going to reproduce some of the things from this notebook for the later part, for five and six. Um, but when I did it, I found myself retranslating most of it because, again, the translation is very bad. Whenever they can use the word commence instead of begin, they do. It commenced. Nobody speaks that way. And so you always have to think that Wittgenstein, that you get this impression of somebody who's a very formal or, you know, distant kind of fussy person, whereas you just have to say it began or it begins, you know, things, things of this sort, which this is just full of. And I think most people don't notice it because you either read it in German, as I imagine Alan does, or you read it in English, as I imagine the rest of you do. And so you don't think about it. You don't think about the translation. And that is such a problem. Well, I've actually been thinking a lot about the translation recently. And I oh, will sure put in a good word yeah. for the 1914-16 notebooks. I mean, 
I think Anscombe in some ways is fresher than either Pez and McGuinness or Ogden with similar material. And I think the translation of the investigations is in all sorts of ways an extraordinary achievement. So she's certainly not the worst of Wittgenstein's translators. Um, so I'm not, I certainly think a better job can be done of the 1914-16 notebooks, but um, I, I would stand up for her level. And the spirit of Christian's defense of the original Wittgenstein trustees, I, I actually have quite a lot of respect for her translation of the notebooks. Um, yep. I, I know you wanted to say something, but may I only interject, uh, as far as I understand it, uh, the Marjorie's uh, publisher uh, wants a book that will um, uh, disclose a hitherto unknown part of the personality of Wittgenstein to a more general reader uh, and uh, wants to publish in in, in 22 for the 100 years uh, Trocletus first publication and so on. So I, I think uh, it, it is about two different books because uh, really scholarly edition in two languages with many uh, uh, scholarly um, annotations will not be understandable to a general audience. Uh, this is as far as I... Yeah, very general. Ray? Yeah, I just wanted Marjorie to respond to your um, saying of Wittgenstein that he was a snob. Um, there may be something in the idea that he was a snob when he was a young man. But what struck me was when he was older and living in Cambridge, you can find far more occasions on which he's actually an anti-snob. Um, exactly. I agree. He, he, he I agree preferred with to be in the company of the working class people in Swansea, in Ireland, in Newcastle, in London. I, um, I got to know the widow of one of his friends, the friend he made in uh, London when he worked at Guy's Hospital, who was a very working class man who lived in a tiny flat in Hackney in East London. And I think one of the things that Wittgenstein liked about the company of Roy Foraker was that it was a refreshing break from all the privileged and upper class people he knew exactly. in Cambridge. Exactly, I think that's exactly so. It's exactly so, but all the more reason to, to see that at the time when he wrote the Tractatus, that was still the family, he was still a little bit under the family, uh, you know, he, how, how could that be otherwise, the way he had been brought up. And then he got away from that. I think that that is what the great story is, completely, and preferred the working class people, which is why he really didn't want to be with the family. And we haven't mentioned in this connection, after all, which I'm not going to be talking about. <laughs> who, who, who first? Yeah. Oh. Uh, well, uh, Wittgenstein, uh, let me just say very quickly, Wittgenstein uh, is entry into the war as an ordinary soldier offended the family enormously because he offended, because that was against their values. What you did in that, in that class, you bought uh, an officer uh, position, uh, which was very easy to do, as his brother Kurt would do. The, the story of Kurt is very interesting here, but it's, it, that's yeah. again another, another story. We're, getting, we're, we're, we're going to uh, the hundreds to thousands in, the, in this discussion, as we should, as we have to, but uh, that's another discussion. Now, I, I, I wanted, to, wanted to say something fundamental about this, uh, the idea that there's an Austrian Wittgenstein, there's, a, there's an English Wittgenstein, uh, because much of that uh, goes back to Wittgenstein's Vienna. Now, uh, what's relevant to our discussion here is that Wittgenstein's Vienna was written in 1971. We had no tech, we had nothing, we had nothing. There was a, there was a great problem uh, with, with the addition of Wittgenstein's Vienna is completely rejected in Germany. Why? Because Wittgenstein's Vienna didn't come out until the mid eighties in Germany. And all the stuff that had been published in the meantime, is it, well, why, why, for example, why isn't the Mishnah Bavarkovan uh, in there? It's full of texts that, that, that support various aspects of, the, of this argument. That, that again is a story unto itself. Uh, Christian, if you want to write, uh, uh, so a, a, a long footnote to something you can write about Wittgenstein's Vienna in German and how it- That's very interesting to me. It took 15 years to come out there. Uh, but uh, um, Toulmin was fond of, of contrasting England and, uh, uh, and, 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 and Vienna. Uh, 
for us it, it, uh, to, to make our case, we had no text, so we had to go to the context. And this is all said, this is all discussed very, very brilliantly and very, very subtly in the introduction of the book, which is the best part of the book, far and away. Uh, where, where Tolman uh, really articulated our methodology. Um, uh, we, we were working with circumstantial evidence. And so we had to make Wittgenstein perhaps more Viennese than he, than he might have been because we didn't have anything else to go on. I, I had hoped every day of my life up to the point where that book was published that a big pile of letters or, an, or, 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 or a new manuscript, something would, 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 would drop down from heaven, uh, which I mean, it finally, it, 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 was, it just began. It just began with the letters to Ficker, uh, uh, you know, at, at the time we, we, we were writing and it went, very, it went in our direction accidentally. Uh, so, I mean, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't make too much of this difference. The, the problem is here with Wittgenstein is uh, the problem is that, that, that there's, there's an aura around him uh, and the texts themselves are, 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 don't, don't tell you, don't give you the answers you want to have. Uh, uh, you, 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 you want to know more why the Tractatus is, in this, is written in, 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 in this very peculiar way, which no philosopher had ever uh, used before. In Wittgenstein is... Uh, is, is in, in the end, he's, he, 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 he's somewhat like Heraclitus, the way he, 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 he's, he's given to us. Uh, with the Tractatus, with, with these other writings, uh, what, what to make of it all? What to make of it all? It's very hard if you, if you just had the, write, the writings and didn't have any con uh, connection with the kind of philosophy uh, that Wittgenstein did to make anything out of what he, uh, what he was up to, even if you're a philosopher, as, as many people did at that time. Uh, we well, I just, I just to, also want to know what you all think in, in this place, relationship. Put of them all someplace where, this, where, 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 where we could make some things concrete and you could explain, you could explain uh, a yeah. whole lot. But I mean, uh, one, one must realize, and, uh, and that is one of the things that I, didn't uh, understand nearly enough. I mean, Witt, the only kind of philosophy that Wittgenstein respected was analytic philosophy. I mean, he, uh, uh, the, the only people he took serious, he, he wanted to demolish the project. I mean, it's, it's, it's very strange, but everything about Wittgenstein is strange, strange, strange. He said, uh, of, 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 of Austrian, uh, of, of good work in it, uh, done by Austrians, uh, it's always more subtle than, than, than that of others, and it's and, and and what comes out is never on the side of, of probability, and this yes. is certainly true of Wittgenstein. Everything about him is <laughs> improbable, uh, and uh, that's where that's where the biographer and the cultural historian uh, uh, so come to uh, come to complement the, the philosophers and philosophical analysts and, and of course philologists. I've said too much. Please. Thank you, Alan. Uh, we have two uh, uh, chat questions on YouTube, uh, most probably for Christian and for David. Uh, the first is from Alfred Schmidt, uh, our friend uh, and colleague from the uh, National Library in Vienna. It is uh, more common. Uh, Alfred says, uh, it is very misleading to, spill, uh, to, to speak still about Geheime Tagebücher. We know that there are simply diaries, the manuscripts 101, 102, 103, which are not separated in two parts. So this is a comment, I think it was touched already in a sense, David? Yeah, I, I think that's precisely right. Um, the only good use for the term is to refer to the text that was published from them in a selective way. Um, Okay, and uh, the next questions are from Gabriel Citron, uh, from, uh, he, he's in Preston, Mary. I believe. Yeah, uh, Gabriel sent, uh, says, congratulations on the book, Christian, and thank you for all the work you have done on this over the last few years. I was wondering what you all think of what Wittgenstein's judgment would have been on the job that the executors ended up doing. 
And lastly, is there one executor's work which we would have approved, which he would have approved more than the others? This was also somehow touched until now, but since the question comes, uh, Gabriel has followed our talk. Uh, uh, the, the, the first question, um, well, I, if you ask me um, uh, what would, Wittgenstein would have said about the additions, it's uh, probably just, um, just as impossible to know as uh, uh, it, it was for Rees impossible to know what uh, uh, he, he should do. Um, according to uh, Wittgenstein's wishes. So it's very si similar, the structure of your question to, to what uh, the editors had to do. Um, but anyhow, so uh, I there's something, well, first of all, I, I can, I, I have something uh, on this question is, um, he, uh, Wittgenstein repeatedly uh, uh, said, uh, or no, um, Ries remembered that Wittgenstein said uh, to him, I trust you completely, Ries, and I trust Ms. Anscombe completely. Um, so uh, there, there is something in it that Wittgenstein didn't know how he should uh, publish his work. He didn't know the best form, but the best thing he could come up with is appointing these three persons and that he uh, didn't give them specific instructions. He, the main thing he said was, I trust you in, in what you are doing. So uh, in this sense, um, I think he, whatever they uh, came up with or would have come up with, Wittgenstein would have said, well, this is what you decided. And he, he trusted in the persons and that they would uh, make a good decision. Um, now I wonder why, why I, I wondered why Wittgenstein would have chosen these three uh, very different characters. Um, knowing all three of them, he probably could foresee that they would have a lot of uh, quarrels and 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 uh, a different uh, perspectives on on their task. Um, I I wonder how how much he could foresee what the, what they. Uh, the, the kinds of discussions they had. But I, the, the answer is probably that he had trust in, in the characters, in all, in all three of them. And uh, um, so this was the best decision he could uh, do at the time when he had to do the decision. So, yes, there was a, the fir your first question, Gabriel. And the second, again, sorry, I didn't oh, get it. Is there... Um... Is there one executor's work which he would have approved of more than the others? Picking up one. Ah, okay. Um, I don't know. I <laughs> um, think, um, well, um, I think he, he would be very uh, sympathetic or uh, congenial to Rees' work. I think Rees had the attitude that. Uh, uh, Wittgenstein himself might have taken when he had uh, got a job like this or a task like this. And uh, the fact that he had chosen Anscombe as a translator uh, uh, shows that he approved Anscombe's um, understanding of his language and, and, and transferring it into English. So I think the, the translation, Anscombe as a translator, um, Rees' way of uh, approaching the task, uh, uh, these two things, uh, he would probably um, be sympathetic with. Uh, and with von Richt, uh, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, maybe he could have discussed it over <laughs> or so, but he didn't, Wittgenstein probably didn't intend uh, to to publish the things um, uh, the the writings as Wittgenstein uh, as von Richt um, did it in the uh, uh, later years, so and and uh, like the let's call it the more the philological approach or the archival approach. I think this was not uh, what Wittgenstein would have wanted, 
and Reese was very clear that uh, this is not the right way. But um, just as Jim said, uh, time uh, went on and there was a time in, in the history, like in the 70s, that uh, then it was right to do it in the more historical, archival or philological way. So, yes. And so I would say probably uh, Anscombe and Rees, uh, they were closer to Wittgenstein's wishes than von Richt. Jim? And Wittgenstein prob probably, knew, uh, probably knew this uh, since he said explicitly, explicitly that he trust, trusted Rees and Anscombe. He did not mention uh, von Richt in this uh, statement. Okay. Yes. Jim, uh, but but and and now when it comes to us now today we have to thank von Richt a lot mm -hmm. uh, that uh, uh, saving all the historical documents um, starting the the research into the origins of the work in a more historical way this uh, was very um, fruitful for further work yes I was I was going to say that. Um, We've mostly kind of, um, there's a tendency to look upon what happened and, you know, sort of see it as a mad plan to have these three people involved. And everything that people have said is true about this. They were spectacularly different people. <laughs> and, 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 what, and, and something um, that was said earlier is by Alan is exactly right, that there was a lot of bitterness underneath this. And what was holding them together was their sense of shared devotion to Wittgenstein that made them sort of just keep talking to each other. <laughs> Otherwise, I think they reached certain junctures where um, they never would have spoken to each other again, or at least neither would have spoken to Elizabeth again. <laughs> um, but, um, but notwithstanding the truth of all of that, I think it's worth also seeing that there's a certain genius in what Wittgenstein did here. And, and, and I don't see there's any reason to assume that he didn't know what he was doing. Um, so um, sort of in a, a way, slightly attacking the premise of Gabriel's question, um, why not suppose um, that Wittgenstein thought each of these people had a kind of appreciation for a dimension of what mattered to him that complemented the strengths but the limitations of each of the others. That there was a kind of concern on Reese's part for exactly what the work looked like and the kind of process of rewriting that Wittgenstein himself was going through and leaving things out and shaping things that he wanted to be brought to the project. He also thought that Reese's attempts to translate his works were really terrible. Although Reese was the person who knew Austrian German dialect um, and that he did not just want a translation that was faithful under a certain conception of faithful translation and that Anscombe, who has to go learn German in order to translate the work, is the person he wants to do it because he has a sense that she has a certain conception of what it is to render the spirit of his thought in English, even if it doesn't involve a certain kind of fidelity to a certain kind of literary scholar's conception of what accuracy of translation is. She'll think of some other example or some other simile in English. They'll hit off the philosophical point, and that's more important to him than having a translation of the simile he chose in German that gives a sense of what the original German words were. And that, that's something he really valued in Anscombe. And more generally, you know, if you just look at his own comments on their philosophical writings in that period, that he's the person who he thought she had the most sense of what his philosophical method was and what his ideas are and what he would have called philosophical logic. Um, and that what um, um, von Richt brought to the project in, this, in the sense that he shared some larger sense of Wittgenstein's cultural and literary and aesthetic interests was something he did not want just left out of the purview of the literary executors as it would have been if it was just Reese and Anscombe. I mean, Ray's complaint about his own book and how it doesn't bring out more of Wittgenstein's um, the importance of music 
to Wittgenstein's sense of things was also a criticism Wittgenstein himself had of his own, of his own published work. And, and, and so he's concerned that this is missing from the investigations and it, it somehow needs to be conveyed, just to take one example, in the larger um, publication of his work then von Richt is a good person to add to this equation um, of the people that are available to him. So I think he's choosing three people that he thinks of for all the difficulty they're gonna have working with each other, balance each, out, each other out in ways he cares about. And, um, and then this goes, I think, with the other thing that Christian just said, but I would like to emphasize, which is that um, there isn't anything which um, just is the thing Wittgenstein would have wanted done. I do think, time makes a huge difference here. I do think the following is obvious. If the first thing they had done would have been to publish the notebooks, including the, decode, the coded remarks, you know, just publish everything as one big manuscript in the way that David Stern is now contemplating doing, as the very first thing that was published in the posthumous writing, I think Wittgenstein would have been very unhappy with that. That would have created a certain kind of reception and a certain kind of focus exactly. on his personal life of a sort that he would not have wanted to be the first thing that happened, even if it was chronologically the first, and even if it was a textually, as it were, you know, in one way, completely uncorrupted edition, which just gave us his remarks as he had them. I and I think all the literary executives were very clear about that, that they were shaping the reception of his work. What Wittgenstein would have wanted right now, after everything else has been published, we have enormous amount of the Nachlass available. We have biographies of his work available. Um, I could imagine, given the realities, you know, of the present um, situation, he might have thought, hell yeah, let, please let David Stern go ahead and now produce this volume that will clear up all sorts of misunderstandings so people can see exactly how the philosophical remarks were juxtaposed with these other remarks and they have the full picture. Um, and, they don't, and they don't believe there's just this thing called the Secret Diaries, which is a separate book. But, but this is, the, these are now decisions against the background of a great many other things that have happened. And, um, and, and what Wittgenstein would have thought at one point in time would have been very different than another. And I think it would have involved his changing and coming to accept a situation that he couldn't possibly have foreseen. That's what I meant by saying, there is nothing which is being able to see your life from the point of view of your doubt. It's not, it's not a perspective you have within your life. Um, and so, um, so, 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 so that means that it's, you know, both if von Rick was just allowed to do what he wanted to do without Anscombe and Reese putting the brakes on him, from the beginning, I think that clearly, I think one we can say this much, that would have made Wittgenstein unhappy. But, but that von Richt was in the picture, allowing us to have a more complete edition eventually, in a way that um, was nicely brought out by Ray. Anscombe wouldn't have cared about it all. She wouldn't have even preserved the materials to let that happen. Um, um, th that, that, um, that is something he might also have valued. And these two things don't actually contradict each other, I think. And, and in retrospect, we can see a certain kind of wisdom, I think, in Wittgenstein is something this team. However, in another way, a motley accrue of people, it seems to us. Can I chip in something and, um, to add to that? I've always thought that the problem with Reese's translation was not his German, but his English. One mm -hmm. of, of Reese's peculiarities was that he wrote English in a very odd way. Um, I sometimes think that Rees wrote English as if it weren't his first language. And I can imagine Wittgenstein looking at this English and saying, no, that's not how I want to be represented in English. But it's also very philosophical English that he produces. You know, he's translating, you know, remarks about naming. He has nominate and nominatum. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. and instead of name and to name, you know, as the translation of nenen or benenen, you know. So. But he also uses very odd sentence structures and, and you know, it doesn't look like idiomatic English. Yes. Can I ask, can I ask David why, um, why you think, um, I'm wrong in saying that the manuscript, that, sorry, that the behind the Bücher go against my point about the manuscripts speaking for themselves. I mean, certainly the uh, Geheimer Bisha will speak, you know, it's a matter that will speak for itself, only it just won't speak genius. Uh, well, I don't know. what he wrote there is, I think, a wonderful literary, personal wartime diary. I mean, I think it absolutely deserves to be published and appreciated in context. 
But the point is that the name, as Alfred Schmidt points out, is deeply misleading. I mean, it's a piece of sensationalism, and it creates a book that is entirely an editorial creation. I mean, Wittgenstein didn't write secret diaries. Someone decided that would be a jolly good title to put out this material that the trustees had, in their wisdom, decided, as Jim points out, wasn't ready for publication yet. What I'm trying to bring out is just that it's too simple to say Wittgenstein's a genius, the writing speaks for itself. Uh, the writing no more speaks for itself than the world speaks for itself. It has to be somehow uh, framed and published. And the decision to take certain pieces of a dead author's writing, put them under a certain title and publish them as a book is a really important activity that we can't take for granted. And it just won't do to say the genius shines through, it doesn't matter. That, that's the point I, I have in mind here. What would you call them, uh, David? Not uh, they're, they're, selection, they're the parts so, of manuscripts 101 through 103 that were not included by the trustees in their edition of the notebooks 1914-16, which also is a misleading title because they actually date from 1917. Um, but anyway, Alan wants to say something about all this, I know. Yes, uh, uh, I'll start with following. Uh, sort of contradicting and not contradicting Jim, because he took both sides of the issue here. Uh, but there is, we do have a phrase planned by a committee. I don't know if Wittgenstein knew this phrase, but he certainly knew what, what, what it meant. Uh, there, is, there, there is something fundamentally problematic about a team. On the other hand, on the other hand, this goes with that point, and it again reinforces exactly what, what Jim is saying, namely, he changes his mind very, very late. Very, very changes his will. Reith is the original executor. Uh, 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 the uh, it, he then says, no, we've got, we've got to have the other two. And so this is the, the, the question that the historian of ideas is faced with is, okay, why does he want to have the other two? Jim has given uh, as good an explanation uh, as, we're, uh, as we're likely to get here. By the way, with, with respect to the diaries, we here in Innsbruck have for, we, we got these things uh, before anybody did, except the Spaniards, because it was originally the Diario Secretos. It's an Italian edition, yeah. No, 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 Spanish. Spanish in Sabet. And, 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 and Italian, Diari Secreti, by leading for Aldo Gigargani. That was, that was much later. That was much later. Uh, the, the, uh, they, 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 they picked that up. We have always spoken of the public and the private diaries. Because this solves the matter uh, qu qu quite, uh, qu uh, quite easily. I mean, Wittgenstein is right. Why, why is he writing in code? He's writing in code because he's shit scared. Yeah. And at, the, at the beginning, of, above all, he's terrified. Of, of what's happening around him, he's, and he's terrified for his life, and, he, and he, he's, he's, he's trying, he's trying to build up the courage to face the war, which he eventually does. He eventually overcomes the fear of death, which is extraordinary. I mean, that's what the, that's the story that's uh, that, that, that's behind these things. Uh, and, and I mean, obviously, if an officer, if one of his superiors sees this, he can he can be shot. He can be shot for expressing these kind of sentiments. So obviously, you don't want you don't want. He, he didn't want certain people to know what was what was in there. Uh, now he he used I mean, it's, it's it's a question, and I'm sure I'm sure my colleague Ilse has somewhere or other dealt with this with this particular issue. We've talked about it enough here over the years. I mean, this takes me back to the '90s, by the way, when we were working on this, when we made the 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 proposal to edit these things together. And the, then the successors of the trustees were not happy with that. They, they, they sort of, they didn't say no, they just sort of stonewalled us. And, 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 and the, the project, we, 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 we did a lot in this direction that never got published, uh, that, that now is probably not even accessible anymore because the software we were using is, 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 so, is, is obsolete. 
but we did a lot of work in in, in this in this direction. We, we, we wanted to do this, uh, and for for a number of reasons. Again, uh, getting into a, a, another kind of Christian Erbach story uh, with with that. I, I'm I I I said almost the day I began with Wittgenstein 55 years ago. If I had anything to do with all of this, I would publish everything. You know, you just because there were so there were these, these rumors about about his private life. There were the, the, the I mean, the, what 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 a lot of people thought, for example, uh, in in the, in the Vienna circle. I mean, uh, you know, basically uh, what, what he was doing uh, in, in later. You know, it was he, he he was picking up stuff. I mean, in Carnap. Uh, 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 Carnap uh, uh, was was the hero. Wittgenstein was the villain. Wittgenstein was simply he he, he was reproducing Carnap in a new way. Uh, other people, other people who wanted to make Wittgenstein into something very very different, they wanted to make him into Heidegger. Really, they said he, you know he's he's getting this all from Diltai somehow or other because you can find this in, in Diltai and very both well, America's foremost Diltai scholar sort sort of. I mean, you have to believe this. I mean, the, the, these were the kinds of. I mean, this, 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 these, these were all things that 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 got that got left over from the Cold War, really. Which I mean, this all began in the Cold War. The Cold War took place within philosophy, uh, 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 as, as well. And this is it's, it's part of the background. It's part of the background to von Richt and his. Because I mean, von Richt was at the beginning of World War II on the wrong side. As Swedes were in Finland, I mean, uh, and and I mean, his interest in Schmengler, his his critique of American culture. He wrote a very a very interesting review of Aldous Huxley in, in 1930. It was 1939, 1940. After many a summer, uh, uh, it's, it's quite interesting. I mean, he his his background uh, was indeed Wittgenstein's. They talked about these things, and this this, this was obviously Im important to both of them, as as were Wittgenstein's uh, 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 conversations with with, with uh, von Rick's friend Knut Olaf Trane, which had nothing to do with philosophy, but, but much much more, much more with with Norway and folk culture. But that's this is another story. But I, I, I do want to say that that. Um, uh, the, the 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 question of of of, the, of a, a group of trustees is 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 a, is a very very is a very curious is a very curious idea. I mean, Wittgenstein himself can't come to a, a, a decision or has has enormous difficulty <coughs> apart from the first part of philosophical investigations about what's to be published. Uh, how does he think that a group of people can somehow uh, with with quite different perspectives? And, you know, and, uh, to take Jim's description was perfect. Uh, uh, that, that that they can do better is, is is sort of beyond me. But I mean, there's a lot in Wittgenstein that I I, I find extremely difficult. I mean, that's what makes him so fascinating because he does he doesn't think like anybody else, as far as I can tell. Yeah, Alan, uh, Jim, uh, you. Want I wanted to um, go back. Uh, originally, I was uh, put up my finger um, just when it was happening. Be, uh, to the exchange between Danielle and, and um, David about the question, you know, does the work speak for itself? Um, I think, you know, an interesting text against which to raise this question that connects nicely with questions thematized by Christian's book is um, the so-called work, Culture and Value. Um, let's take that book. Now, um, in one way, what on an, one understanding of, what, of Danielle's remark, it's extremely true of everything in that book, kind of at the level of a remark or a numbered passage, um, or an unnumbered passage in that case, um, that, um, that it speaks for itself. I mean, I think it's just, you know, it's part of the wonderful selection that von Rieck has done, that the book is an assemblage of gems. So one can take any any passage, you know, something that has the unity of a remark, a beginning, a middle, and an end in that book, and read it, and the brilliance of the thinker, and the thoughtfulness of it, and the way in which it reflects an entire 
life of considering what the relation is between philosophy and music and culture and religion and logic. And the, even the beauty with which the remarks are turned all immediately, I think, are evident to anybody with any sensibility. In that sense, the work, as it were, communicates itself and, and doesn't require an editor to do that. But in another sense, um, of course, um, saying the work, culture and value speaks for itself, um, would involve some confusion. I had a student who came up to me and said, you know, I've been reading Wittgenstein's books and my favorite is Culture and Value. It's a really great book. Did he write any other books <laughs> like that? Um, you know, to which, you know, the answer was, how, and actually what the student says was, how many books like that did he write? And I said, zero. In fact, <laughs> one less than your question assumes. <laughs> um, and, and, and so, um, so, 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 so that, you know, that work does not speak for itself in that sense. And indeed, insofar as one takes it to be a work in the way that student does, insofar as it speaks for itself, we could say, putting things a little picturesquely, it tells a lie. <laughs> um, that is, it's not a book by Wittgenstein. Um, and, and so that does mean, and now that's an extreme case. It's a much more extreme case than the more complicated case that Christian describes very beautifully as an early editorial project, Remarks on the Foundations of Mathematics. But Remarks on the Foundations of Mathematics is somewhere on a spectrum between just sort of publishing everything as you find it and culture and value. But, but it is a work that has been crafted. So a certain understanding of what the unity of the work is. And um, even that it should be titled Remarks on the Foundations of Mathematics that involve leaving a lot of things out. I don't think actually Wittgenstein would have ever titled his books in that way. This one's about mathematics. This one's about psychology. We could talk about why, but he never played with such titles. Even his lecture courses are given titles that involve a certain conception of philosophical departments that I, I don't see influencing his own thinking. He moves between these things seamlessly. These books are partly created by pulling the mathematics stuff out and pulling the, something that somebody thinks is psychology out and putting them in different books. Um, and so, um, so there is a certain, um, I'm not criticizing here, I'm just pointing out that our conception of what the unity of these works are as separate books um, are artifacts of publishing decisions. That's not a criticism. That is literally what Wittgenstein, I think, initially was asking his editors to do, was to create books. But I think David's right. We do need to have some appreciation for the fact that our sense of what the unity of the work is, and that this is one unit and that's another unit, and what's been left out has been left out by a certain kind of decision, and that this is the appropriate title, and that this is the purview of it, it involves a shaping of Wittgenstein's work. Yeah. It's not just the work speaking for itself. And I think both those points can be true. Um, they don't, they're actually not in competition with each other, but I do think, um, but, each, each, but, but if either point seems to eclipse the other, then I think we've missed something. And I think part of the beauty of Christian Erbacher's own book is he brings out you know, both dimensions of this difficulty. Can I just, can I just reply to that? I, 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 I didn't say that the work speaks for themselves, but the manuscripts speak for themselves. And I think, mm -hmm. and I, I don't agree with Alan that um, everything, everything should be published because I appreciate the work of the editor. I very much appreciate Anscombe and, and um, uh, von Richt having uh, compiled the notes on uncertainty the way they did. It saves me from having to go through the whole thing. And they did it in a way which made me understand what Wittgenstein was saying. And I perhaps would not have understood it um, as easily if I had to go through the whole manuscript. So of course it's important. They've got a hugely important um, uh, impact on, on, on the reception. On reception. But, um, but yeah, the um, manuscripts make their own case, is what I was trying to say, really. It, it, it not, uh, they, they don't depend on the editors to, to, to make their own case. They, they depend on, we depend on the editors, definitely, to get, to get, the, um, to get what Wittgenstein was saying in a more economical and, and more accessible uh, way. No. But what, what, is, what does that mean? To go, to go call through the whole manuscript, all the manuscripts. But what does that mean, Daniel? I mean, let's just take a case from uncertainty then. I'm, I'm not arguing for a position. I'm just giving you an yeah. example of, of how two people could disagree. So when they first look at uncertainty, um, there are all these remarks. They're trying to arrange them chronologically. 
um, and so forth. They number them, and we get the book we have now. Now, say someone else goes back at the manuscripts. You don't have to accept the premise. Just, just accept it as a hypothetical. Yeah. And they notice, well, there was a big break between this numbered section and that numbered section. They were, they were separate, and they were put together and numbered through. And also, they discovered by reading some biographical material, First, Wittgenstein read one of these two mm -hmm. more essays, Proof of the External World and Defense of Common Sense. And he wrote all of those remarks having read one of them. And then he read the other more essay. And then he wrote all the other, or reread it. You know, we know this from biographical material. And then he wrote the other set of remarks. And so the, the things that are treated in numbers as if they're all just remarks about more, there's actually a break there. And the first set of remarks are in one more essay and the other ones are another more essay. And that's, and if you know that, you might view the book differently. So, so it's, it's not that that's not known by looking at the manuscripts, but it's in, it involves yeah. taking a certain break in how things are stored and not just taking it as an accident mm -hmm. of a notebook having run out or there being two different boxes, but suddenly investing it with significance involves an extra bit of biographical material about yeah. what Wittgenstein was reading and responding to. This could make a difference. It could make a difference to how you might want to number or present things yeah. in the manuscript afterwards. So, so, how, so, so just numbering it through without any break gives one impression. Yeah. Doing it another way gives another impression. These, these are decisions that have a certain faithfulness. The remarks in the foundations of mathematics are broken up into parts. They're not just yeah. numbered through one to you know, a very large number. And, and so those are decisions that I think can be quite faithful in shaping the reception, in, uh, whether you think they're just more type propositions, or whether you think Wittgenstein thinks they're two very different kinds of examples and more that have to do with two essays. I'm not saying which reading is right, which re maybe the second approach would invest too much significance in those things that people noticed. And you think, yeah, well, those are all true, but it was better they did it the old way. But you, these decisions are decisions. Um, the manuscript yeah. itself doesn't Absolutely. tell you. Absolutely. And, and, and for me, as long as these decisions give you what uncertainty, as I know it, gives you. In other words, you know, a, a, a solution to the problem of, uh, of regress and all other things that uncertainty gives you, I'm fine. As long as that, those, deci those decisions culminate in, in solving philosophical problems or dissolving them, the way that uncertainty does, I'm fine. You know, it could have been done another way as long as the, the success story of uncertainty is there. I'm just explaining what I meant by the manuscript doesn't speak for itself. The manuscript ha is, is, is shaped a certain way by a set of decisions that, as you rightly say, should be informed by a philosophical understanding of what Wittgenstein thought he was doing. Yeah. Alan, yes, just a moment, because the same question that uh, uh, Daniel uh, asked uh, more or less uh, um, a little uh, time ago uh, comes from Alfred Schmidt, but I want to quote him. Uh, he says, uh, how does the complete electronic edition of the Nachlass change our view of the print edition of the trustees? Isn't the electronic edition the more authentic way of publishing, more or less along the s same lines. I wanted to mention that, uh, Alfred. Alan? Yeah, yeah uh, just to, uh, speaking to Alfred, that wasn't what I wanted to say, but it, I mean, basically, uh, yes and no. The, the, the complete electronic edition of the works and the letters, remember that the, the letters, have been, all of Wittgenstein's correspondence has been, uh, has been edited with, with full commentary by the Bremer archives. All of this, these are controlled instances. These are controlled instances. These help you understand the, 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 the printed text and help you to evaluate all the problems that, that, that we've been talking about. I want, to, I, want to, I want to make the problem, though, that we've been discussing here a little bit more uh, complicated by saying that there, uh, not everybody is aware of the fact that, for example, with respect to culture and value, I'll, I'll use the English, yeah, it's important that I speak the English edition here, there are, there are four different versions of that. They're, they're, the, they're, the, they're the initial versions of von Richt in German, uh, which has nothing, there's no commentary, and it doesn't have all the texts that were, were published later by Winch. Uh, the, then there's, the, there's always Pichler's uh, 
uh, additions and, and more, more critically, more done, done more reflectively and with access to the, uh, to the electronic edition. Then there's Winch's translation. And Winch's German was not always wonderful. Uh, Brian McGuinness was very, very upset by the way when, uh, and Brian told me this, that when von Richt uh, uh, informed him uh, upon asking for permission to translate that, that permission had already, already been gr uh, granted to, to Winch and this is, this is going to be a disaster. Uh, and Winch admitted that because he translated the, he translated uh, Culture and Value a second time. Um, the second translation is in many respects worse than the first. The first is, is, uh, is wobbly, the second one uh, the second one corrects the, the, the most egregious errors in the first one, but makes other errors. Because uh, I, I evaluated all of this, I read all of these editions together with my assistants. Uh, this is all available uh, in Bergen uh, or in Innsbruck. Uh, for any, uh, 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 we, we, for, for various reasons of copyright, we couldn't, we couldn't publish this, which, which broke my heart. We did the same for the lecture on, on, on lectures on aesthetics, by the way, but, but uh, that's another story because it's more complicated. But here, um, okay, so there are four different versions. Now, now you, you very naively, you want to know, uh, you've heard that Wittgenstein has, has these interesting remarks on culture. You go into the, you go into the bookstore, you, you don't know anything about this, you're not a scholar. Um, what what version do you get with, with culture and value? The interesting thing is, uh, the, the the publisher must have must have put out a must have printed a huge number of the first edition because what you get in a normal bookstore is the first edition uh, the, uh, the, uh, of 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 Winch, uh, and and I mean basically uh, he, something which he he rejected. Uh, so so that I mean. Uh, I mean, everything about that book is is problematic. And again, one can one, one can cite it. One I have worked on it ex extensively myself. And, but uh, you know, everything with respect to that book has to has to be dealt with cum and salis. And that's that's an essential part of, of of this of this story, or a footnote at least uh, to, to the story that that Christian has so nicely told us. That's it. Yeah. Christian, you have written a book that uh, evokes a lot of discussion and uh, emotions. I mean, not, not, not only between us tonight, but uh, what I understand also from comments and questions coming and yeah, what can be better? Sorry. Yeah, I, I wanted to... Um also to respond to the question of the complete uh, electronic edition and mm. then the question whether this is more or less authentic um the the way i see it is uh that uh to the fact that we have all the manuscripts now and all the letters uh makes it easier for us to see what the editors have done and makes it easier to uh, for us to to uh, appreciate what they have done because now that we uh, we see all the manuscripts, their complexity, how difficult it is to uh, read through them, and then to put you in, in uh, yourself into the position to decide what to publish as a book in order to make uh, uh, Wittgenstein's writings available in a readable way. It's a very difficult task, and I think uh, uh, it's good that. Uh, the editions from the literary executors are free now from the question, is this everything or not? Uh, because it's obvious uh, we have everything in the electronic form and we can uh, appreciate uh, the great work that the editors uh, have done. Um, and it's very important to that the electronic um, well the storing and the making available in electronic form uh, goes on i think that's the continuation of the of the editing story so in a sense the book is only the first part uh, and then the it goes on it's a live lively uh, uh, 
story, the editing. Yes. Thank you. Jim? I mean, I, I do, I mean, I think from the point of view of an archivalist, one wants something like a complete edition of all the remarks. But I do think it's very important to understand that Wittgenstein's aim was not to produce an object for an archivalist, which um, consisted of all the remarks he ever wrote down. Um, he was trying to produce works of philosophy, finished one his lifetime, the Tractatus, and he almost finished one in his lifetime, the Investigations. Um, and, and part of what makes the Investigations a work, especially the first half of the Investigations, it has a certain status, is that the remarks, it is not just a collection of 600 some remarks. The book begins exactly the way he wanted it to. And he thought very hard about how he wanted to begin. And it has that preface. And then it starts with a quotation from Augustine. And it starts with a remark that says something about that quotation. And then it starts, and then it goes into certain examples. And then it starts to comment on those examples. And so on. That is to say, the, the remarks are not just a collection of remarks. They are an ordered sequence. And they're to be read in a certain order. And part of understanding the book involves asking oneself the question, why does this remark follow that remark, <laughs> um, something you know that also you know is clearly true of the Tractatus as well, and the numbering the Tractatus brings out, and um, so the editors were not just given a lot of posthumous material that they were supposed to produce. Sorry about that. We have some kind of emergency in Chicago apparently. Um, that's that's the city warning us that there's a flood or a tornado or something usually. Um, so. Um, so, so, um, so what they were trying to do, and, and, and you know, various people have brought out, Christian's book brings out the impossibility of this, is they were trying to, after Wittgenstein died, bring out books that had this character, not of being collections of remarks, but consisting of numbered sections in which the order of the remarks involves a development of thought. And, and, and of course, a great deal of the order is taken from these remarks occurring in a certain order in Wittgenstein's text. They didn't, you know, with the exception of Settle, wind up just completely shuffling the deck, <laughs> um, but, um, and then trying to reconstitute it. But still they were making various decisions and that's a very different and difficult task they were presented with, how to present a collection of remarks as an ordered sequence. And, um, and at a certain point when um, von Richt is archiving the manuscripts and we move into a different stage of Wittgenstein reception and we're just trying to preserve things as they've come down to us that's no longer um, the aim the aim is to just as it were present the collections as they happen to fall <laughs> um, without without a, a clear sense of um, you know the degree of authorial attention in the significance of the order because many of Wittgenstein's notebooks were I think really notebooks where he wrote things down, which he then had the intention to order. And you can see this very clearly in the way he cuts things up and reshuffles them. So he's sort of gathering mosaic stones to put into a mosaic. And it's very important that some of these things are collections of mosaic stones and other things are fragments of mosaics. And the only complete mosaics we have are the Tractatus, you know, ordered the way Wittgenstein wanted to and the first half of the investigations. And I think, that difference in status, something that has the unity of the work and something that has this other character of, you know, being, as it were, materials from the workshop <laughs> that was supposed to be turned into a work, I think is something that needs to be respected and understood. And, and um, that's something I think gets lost if one thinks that the Bergen electronic edition is now just the best edition of Wittgenstein's work we have and we should just go read that and everything else is relevant. Well, perhaps we can wrap it up with this. Uh, this sums it up uh, our current situation. The with Bergen, what Jim said, I think uh, is where we are today, and where also uh, Christian's book ends. Um, thank you so much. Um, I hope we will have opportunities to, to do this form 
also on other topics again. And I promise that the embarrassment of the video from the beginning will not happen again. I've learned how it should be done. Um, and uh, thank you very much for, to our live audience. This video will be available from tomorrow after tomorrow permanently on our YouTube channel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, uh, I just want to take the opportunity. Thank all of you for reading uh, my book and uh, responding uh, in the way that you did today. It, uh, that was great, great to be part of. Thank you. Thank you for writing the book, Christian. Yeah. <laughs> and doing all of the research. That's really wonderful. Yeah. Well, it's a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> uh,